Welcome to Copenhagen, host city for Electronomous, the International Mobility Summit. A vibrant metropolis and one of the world's most livable cities. Blessed with bundles of Scandinavian charm, this harbour city frequently tops the rankings for quality of life. With Copenhagen's strong focus on sustainability and its ambition to be carbon neutral by 2025, we are delighted to call it home for the next two years. Copenhagen is a lively capital city with a cosy feel, a cultural hub that's simple to navigate. Airport transfer to the city centre takes just 12 minutes by metro, with hotels and the event venue all within easy reach of public transport lines. Explore every inch of the city like a local. The streets are bicycle friendly, with dedicated bike lanes shared by tourists and commuters alike. Meet government and city managers, policy makers, mobility startups, micro mobility companies, venture capitalists, investors, and the shapeshifters leading the charge in this new era of mobility and smart city technology. Discover world renowned Danish design, architecture, fashion, museums, lush parklands, or take a swim in the harbour. Top it off with new Nordic cuisine, served at Michelin-starred restaurants and street food markets. You can find it all in Copenhagen. Electronomous, future mobility, livable cities and sustainable transport. Join our global community. Live in Copenhagen and online at electronomous.com. Hello and a warm welcome to Electronomous 2021, the International Mobility Summit. I'm June Young, your host, live from Copenhagen. It's day three of our online event, where you get to engage with our amazing lineup of movers and shakers of future mobility and smart cities. Post your tweets or comments about this event on social media with the hashtag TIMS2021. We continue to encourage you to engage with our speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A section. It's the Q&A tab, not the chat tab, the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of your screen. You can, of course, use the chat tab if you wanted to message one of your fellow attendees. But during the Q&A with our speakers, you're doing me a favor by putting your questions in the Q&A section. So it's just easier for me to facilitate the questions with the speakers more seamlessly. By now, you have met many representatives of our great partners and content providers. You get to further interact with them by clicking on the Expo tab on the left side of your screen. Above Expo, you'll see a networking tab. And if you're not too shy, why don't you give this networking feature a try and make a video call to another attendee you would like to connect with. Drop us a note in the chat if you face any difficulties with any of this or email us at info at electronomous.com. Important reminder, tomorrow is the day. We are meeting in person at the Bella Center Copenhagen and happening tomorrow after our online show at 3 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. CET. The amazing lineup include Chris Peters, Vice President of the European Investment Bank, Georgie Smallwood from Tier Mobility, Anders Wall from Green Mobility, a special session by Arab Group and McKinsey, along with Matthew Baldwin, Deputy Director of DG Move at the European Commission. Let me tell you, you do not want to miss out on any of this. So get your tickets now at electronomous.com. Now, Getting straight into our first agenda, we have been bringing to you live in a studio in Blogs Hub for three days now. The home of Blogs Hub is a striking new building shared by the Danish Architecture Center. Blogs Hub itself is the Nordic hub for sustainable urbanization. They were founded on the belief 
that the challenges of global urbanization and climate change require partnerships and new ways of collaboration. So, Blocks Hub brings together dozens of other design-related organizations and companies, creating solutions for cities. And I must say, I'm kind of jealous at how beautiful this office space is and how everyone here just gets to work here every single day. So, in this opening session, we will have two back-to-back -back speakers joining us in the studio. First up is Martina Kilby from Blocks Hub. And then she will be joined by Dr. Robert Joseph Martin, Head of Mobility at Yaya Architects. So, right now we have uh, Martina in the studio with us. Very happy to have you here, and I'll leave it up to you to present to our audience. Thank you so much, June. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation uh, coming here today. And uh, it's been a pleasure hosting you here at uh, Blockshop, the building here in uh, Copenhagen, which is shown here in the background. And uh, right now I will uh, spend the next 15 minutes to tell you a little bit more about what is Blockshop exactly, how do we work creating the cities of the future, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to really uh, look into this work in a brand new way. All right, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, uh, as you see here on the screen uh, behind me, Blocks Hub is indeed uh, a great building here at the harbor front in, uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, we have uh, actually gathered a lot of companies and organizations here, around uh, 150 to be exact. Um, but Blocks Hub is uh, way more than a co-working space. So this I'm going to tell you a little bit more about now. My name is Martine, and uh, I work with the global collaboration and partnerships here at BlocksHub. And uh, this is also why I'm really happy to get the word out there about how can you actually collaborate with BlocksHub and what is the whole purpose. So uh, to start from the beginning, uh, we have a, a philanthropic private fund, Real Dania, and the, energy, uh, the Ministry of Business and Copenhagen municipalities that comes together around this idea of creating a hub uh, in the center of Copenhagen that actually gathers all the solutions that we already have today to promote and to, to really uh, upgrade the cities that we have into the future in a sustainable and, and more holistic way. So um, they actually had the idea of this, this building and uh, it was quite quickly filled up with uh, companies and organizations all working within the urban area. So um, after the building was filled up, we actually just, just turned uh, the whole Blocks Hub idea into a membership-based organization. So today we have almost 400 members working from everywhere around the world, uh, all towards the same goal of creating uh, the cities of the future. And how do we actually do this? You know, one thing is that we gather a lot of uh, solutions uh, from the companies and the organizations that work here at the same place for them to interact, for them to look at challenges from different angles, and uh, also, of course, to be in physical contact to, at events and uh, in network uh, um, surroundings so that uh, we really get to interact with each other. And uh, the network, the ecosystem that we represent, about the 400 members that I mentioned before, is crucial to lift up the level of competences that we have and the way we look into challenges of the future. But we actually tap, take a step further than that. Uh, we try to look uh, not only across sectors on the challenges that uh, we have today that are very uh, difficult to solve on our own, we also look into collaboration across border and to look into the innovation part and the creation part of the solutions that we have and we want to create. So we are trying to to lift the level of the knowledge that we have today and can share with each other because we don't know we don't all know the same but we can all benefit from uh, knowing uh, something that we didn't know before so this is actually a very big part of this knowledge exchange that the blocks up uh, supports here and also uh, we work uh, more concrete in the innovation area which i'll tell you a little bit more about but uh, regarding the collaboration here, we have partners all over the world that I'll tell you more about in the next coming slides. So um, when we say we work within 
the urban area and uh, within uh, urban sustainability, how, what does we act, what, what do we mean? I mean, it's a very broad term and sometimes it's good to have an idea on what companies can actually be part of Blockshop and who do we collaborate with and in what areas. And these are some of the focus areas that we have at Blockshop. And um, the so uh, circular societies, of course, is a central point where uh, we need to circle, uh, circle everything that uh, we use and spend, materials, but also the societies in general. This is something that we see as a stronghold here at, at Blockshop. And also the urban mobility, of course, this is also the reason we are taking part here today, is very, very central to the way uh, we work uh, in cities around the world, where urban mobility is, is much more than, than e-mobility and uh, new solutions. It's also combining, oh, sorry, it's also combining different focus areas to actually implement the new solutions in the cities. And uh, livable and healthy cities are, of course, also a very central focus of Blockshop and the companies and, and organizations that works here. Um, because um, to have a city, to make it sustainable, to make it uh, resilient and to make it future-proof is a great thing. But we need to do it around the life that we actually want to create in the city. So this is a very, very important focus area for us. We also, of course, look at how do we create sustainable buildings? How do we make them energy efficient? And how do we make our cities uh, resilient towards the changes that happens around us? So these are just some examples of where we are really putting some effort into gathering uh, solutions, views, knowledge that we can share with our partners abroad. As, as uh, horizontal uh, through these focus areas, we have design processes um, because, you know, the most important thing when we work within these area is actually to get the right and the most efficient way from A to B. So the process, the whole way we design this, um, this work, this innovation is very, very crucial to, to how we support uh, the development that happens between our partners and our members. So this is something that simply goes through everything we do. And the digitalization, uh, not so many years ago, this was more or less a, a vertical, but I think we can all agree it's not anymore. Digitalization is everywhere and it's also included in all the areas that we look into. And so is governance. And uh, of course, this is a crucial uh, focus area for us as well, as we have a close collaboration with both the Ministry of Business and the Municipality of Copenhagen and many other uh, cities around the world. So, of course, this is something that we can tap into and uh, look into the framework um, yeah, all the time, really. So, uh, what I want to show you with this slide is uh, a bit of who, who are we then? What is Blockshop and who do we actually um, represent when we uh, ask you to collaborate with us. So I, I shortly explained about uh, the network, the ecosystem that we have here in Copenhagen, which is the A on this, is this slide. But we also have a whole network of partners abroad where we work very closely with other hubs and networks that work the same way and have the same aims at Blockshub do. Uh, but uh, also with, uh, with partners, uh, private partners that work within this area and want to push this agenda. And of course, a lot of cities, a lot of private companies abroad that also want to take this big, big leap, this step into how do we actually work for future solutions. And um, between these two lines, uh, the, the local hub in Copenhagen and all what we do internationally, is of course all the high quality competences that we involve in this uh, area. So, so this is the whole idea of activating the knowledge that we have from different sectors into the challenges that we see around the world. And uh, we do this uh, by combining a lot of different sectors. And this is, of course, very crucial when we look into the very complex challenges. 
that we also have the financial sector represented, that we have academia represented, that we have tech companies, uh, strategic focused companies, that we have a lot of different actors and stakeholders looking into the same challenge to take the right steps and decisions. And this uh, last uh, picture here really shows that this is done within uh, sustainable urbanization in many ways uh, or many areas of the cities. So uh, this could be both, as I said, on the mobility side, on the building side, on the, on the more uh, planning side, and in, in detail in the um, IoT side, and it can be in many different areas. So um, how do we actually do this? You know, we would uh, very much like to, to interact with uh, all of you people out there that knows about challenges, that want to interact with our network and want to be included in the discussions and all the great things that are going on here. Um, and the way we normally do this is uh, when someone wants to, to, to interfere or interact, sorry, with the, with the um, ecosystem here, the first step is, is often that some kind of challenge is, uh, is identified. So some kind of challenge is taken to Blocks Hub, as shown here in the picture in the first uh, corner here. Um, and we look at it uh, under a magnifier and say, OK, is this really, what, what kind of challenge is this? Is it the right questions that we ask? Is, uh, is it the right partners and stakeholders we involve to, to find the, the results and the solutions? And then we activate our ecosystem, as I just showed you before. And uh, we can then take the next step to put them around a table, digitally or physically, um, with our ecosystem and, uh, and look much deeper into the challenge in uh, an innovation process and uh, even all the way to a creation phase and maybe even prototyping together uh, with our network. And these uh, guys around the table will, of course, then uh, represent different sectors so that we really get a holistic and future-proof solution to this challenge. When we then take the, the outcome of this discussion further, this often uh, leads to many synergies that we see around because the whole, the whole uh, level of understanding is uh, increased and uh, this knowledge can be used by all the partners involved and sitting around the table. So um, you're very, very welcome to contact us to, uh, to get involved, uh, to be a member and part of our community, but also to, uh, to be involved in, uh, in this challenge process. So um, I would be delighted to hear from you uh, after this session. Just uh, finally, I would like to give you some examples uh, of areas that we worked in. We have looked into how do the future workplace look uh, how do we actually help a, a campus in New York getting totally uh, circular? Um, how do we work with mobility in different cities around the world to create new mobility strategies? Uh, how do we make new financial models for coastal protection? And why is light important and how should we include it in the way we build buildings? So these were just some examples, and uh, I think I will uh, finish off here and uh, then leave the word to one of our members here today, Yaya Architects, and uh, give you some more detailed insights into one of our topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. That was a very insightful discussion and a presentation to tell us more about Blocks Hub and, of course, all the solutions that you're working on and the partnerships that you have formed. And also, thank you for letting us use this studio. Much appreciated. Wonderful office that you have. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very, you very much. much. So, Martin has briefly introduced the next guest to you. Yes, she talked about urban mobility, but what about the urban streets themselves? And how should we use it? Perhaps some of us wouldn't ask this question, but it's really interesting that Yaya Architects has really shed the light on this. How should we use our urban streets? So with us here in the studio, we have Dr. Robert Joseph Martin, Head of Mobility at Yaya Architects, to share more. So Robert, I'll leave it up to you. Welcome to the studio. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for Blocks Hub for hosting this today. Um, yeah, should I start? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, I represent Yaya Architects. Uh, we're an architecture and urban design firm based here in Copenhagen, Denmark. And 
although we work across all building scales, typology, strategies, my team is particularly focused on the future of mobility and how we can use that uh, to create more livable and healthy and active cities. Um, I also just wanted to say uh, um, happy World Car Free Day, uh, because uh, that's today. And I think it's a great initiative that actually um, highlights the impact that cars have on our urban environments. And by, by removing them, what, what other ways we could use that space for. Um, but I think that uh, what you actually find with the term car free is that it's, it's a little bit of a divisive term where um, it automatically pits people in two groups, whether that's pro-car on one side or anti-car on the other. And so by talking about car freeness, you're automatically starting an argument with people. Um, and so at Yaya, what we've been trying to develop is a new communication tool that we can talk to people about sustainable urban mobility. Um, we've called it the mobility pyramid, and it's, it's very much influenced by the, the food pyramid that we all know, uh, having grown up, which can kind of guide us um, uh, to a healthy uh, and sustainable diet. Um, and most importantly, what we like about um, this tool for talking about mobility is that it doesn't exclude any one group. It recognises that for some people, a car is an essential part of their day. Um, but for others, maybe they can get by with it a little less. And so we think if we want uh, healthy urban environments, then we should focus much more on those active, um, small, shared and sustainable forms of mobility. Um, and to give you an idea about what this means in practice, this image here, um, I think, is the 100% like, the burger and soda diet. It's, it's cars everywhere. It's, it's not a very inviting and, and, and um, happy environment. Um, whereas this is then the spatial realization of that mobility pyramid, um, where you can see that there's still space for cars, but there's much more space for other modes of transport, such as um, bicycles, cargo bikes, shared cars, um, as well as the infrastructure to support electric vehicles. But most importantly, what we find here is that there's space for people to be on the street, um, uh, where families and children can once again use the street as a, as a social space. Cafes can extend out and create new commercial opportunities. Um, and, and, and I would say that this is representing our, our kind of ideals as a practice in the way that we try and imagine new streets. But I think that transportation and the future of mobility is actually quite um, a complicated uh, industry because you have many different uh, disciplines working within it. And so as an architecture firm, we've been working on a new methodology for a way for us to engage these other disciplines. Um, and it combines uh, two, uh, two existing methods called backcasting and prototyping. And while individually they're not uh, maybe novel, uh, we think that the combination of them actually can be quite fruitful in the discussion. Um, so I'll just explain backcasting to begin with. And that is quite literally the opposite of forecasting, where forecasting um, takes historical data and tries to um, extrapolate it into the future to guess what's going to happen. Uh, backcasting does the opposite, where you start with that desirable future that you want and you try and work out the steps in order to get there. Um, it's really changing the kind of ontology that we use to plan transport from a, a predict and provide, uh, which is forecasting, to a decide and provide, uh, which would be backcasting. And an example of this would be some of the research uh, projects that Yaya does. This, for instance, is an image from uh, a project we did investigating the spatial implication of shared autonomous vehicles, um, where you can see we are investigating how do existing public transportation infrastructure actually have to adapt to allow these uh, new shared services. And, and on, while one side we were investigating um, you know, how does transportation adapt, on the other side we were looking at okay, how does this affect our, 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 our cities and our suburban streets? So we can see in this image, um, we've tried to reimagine what is otherwise a monofunctional uh, residential area into how can shared autonomous fleets actually provide new ways to uh, use this space, where you can see there's much more children playing in it, there's different typologies of buildings, new functions, which is allowed by the safety and kind of sustainability uh, kind of aspects of, of autonomous vehicles. Um, uh, prototyping, on the other side, balances um, uh, this methodology by taking that vision for the future and placing it in the present. Um, it's about trying to gain knowledge about this future vision by, by actually testing these ideas with people um, to find out if, if these ideas about the future are actually things that people want. 
Um, and, and Yaya have been involved in a number of uh, projects um, such as this street transformation in the northern Danish city of Aalborg, um, which is a one-year pilot project removing uh, uh, parking spaces to provide more amenities. Uh, we also have projects that look into um, new types of uh, smart street infrastructure uh, that try and balance all the new um, demands of the street, uh, um, you know, such as delivery, such as bicycles, such as scooters, such as public transport, cars, autonomy, um, to try and look at, okay, how do we create embedded surfaces that can actually allow for, um, allow for wide bicycle lanes while still providing shelter for passengers of, um, uh, of public transport. So you can kind of see there that the, our methodology balances both a long-term vision for the future, um, which kind of guides the work that we do today. Um, but, but by taking that vision and placing it into the present through prototyping, we're actually able to get knowledge on that. And what that does here in this sort of yin and yang type diagram is it shows that our, our, our vision uh, for the future is guiding our work today, but that vision is actually influenced by the work that we're doing in the present. Okay, um, I'm now going to go through one of our pilot projects in a little bit more depth for you. Um, now, this was a, um, a, another street transformation project uh, in the, one of the inner districts of Copenhagen, um, where if you can see by this image, um, this is the kind of, uh, this is the, um, like what is greeted by residents when they actually leave the front door. And I would say, for one of the cycling capitals of the world, this isn't how the residents should actually meet the street. You can actually see here that cars have become so impactful on this street that they've actually started to take up more room on the sidewalk, um, uh, where like pedestrians and cyclists now have to negotiate this very small space, not leaving for much room for anything else. Um, and we chose this street because it was very well connected with other types of uh, mobility options. So you can see here that within a, a very small walking distance, you were connected to both a new uh, metro line, um, different uh, uh, bus lines in the city, as well as um, you know, the, the, the dense network of uh, bicycling infrastructure that we have here in uh, Copenhagen. Um, and so what we did is we offered all the residents in the street um, a mobility package which combined uh, a number of different uh, modes um, such as car sharing, car hire, bicycle hire, public transport into this mobility package um, which provided to the residents uh, either free or heavily discounted access to these services. And they were offered this in, in exchange for the, um, for the parking places on their street. Um, now this uh, would go on for about a year. Uh, this pilot project. Um, and, and the basic idea was that you would take uh, a street that was otherwise uh, extremely kind of favoured towards uh, automobiles and, and we would kind of reverse that hierarchy by still allowing cars in the street but then providing much more space for people to exist in it. Um, once we had created that, that new one-way uh, street width um, we then were able to create some shifts in the street, not only to create new spatial opportunities on either side, but also as a way of slowing down vehicles as they, um, uh, as they go into it, because this was no longer a street that was, like, uh, was, was trying to help cars get somewhere as quickly as possible. We were trying to slow them down through the built environment. Um, we did allow uh, places for people to pick up and drop off, um, say if there was for deliveries or the elderly or disabled, there was still space for a little bit of cars in the street. Um, but primarily what we were trying to do is introduce new qualities into the street, such as these ground floor gardens for the, um, for the ground floor uh, apartments that otherwise uh, are kind of the most disadvantaged in the street because they're closest to the noise, they have the least amount of daylight, and they don't have balconies like other apartments do. But we also provided um, new communal spaces, such as new urban uh, nature and places uh, for social connection for the residents uh, in the street. Um, and you can see here, uh, compared to that first image that I showed you of the existing street, we've kind of changed the street from, uh, say, a container and storage place for cars into this new living street, which is much more dedicated to people. Now, although this uh, was a pilot project uh, considered for one year, um, we didn't want this to only be a year and then all the kind of time and resources that were invested in it uh, were kind of wasted. We think that any pilot project should actually have a, a future impact no matter how short the time uh, span. And so 
if we went from the pilot project lasting a year, the, the residents were actually given a series of options about what they could do um, after the one year period uh, could go, whether they could either return it to almost the original condition, but with a slight upgrade, all the way to implementing the full vision um, uh, permanently. And I'll just step you through these, these options that they were presented, where this is the existing situation, which is otherwise dominated by cars, uh, and this was the pilot project uh, that lasted for a, for a full year. And then they were given, the residents were given the options whether they could take back 50% of the car parking. So you can see here that um, we've gone from 90 degree to uh, parallel parking, which provided more width in the street, but, but, but less efficient parking methods. Um, we went to 90% parking, um, which, which still allowed most of the parking spaces back, but then still allowed for some new urban nature and some urban greenery. Um, or then our kind of preferred option, which was the, uh, which was the, the kind of um, making permanent the, the pilot project. So it was kind of placing those surfaces um, in, in a more permanent way. Uh, yeah. And, and fundamentally what we were trying to do uh, with this project is take uh, this, this street that, as I said before, shouldn't be representative of one of the world's cycling capitals um, and, and change it into a street which was much more a uh, human scale for people to come together um, where there's still place for cars in the background but there's much more um, social activity, urban nature for climate resilience and, and generally, from my opinion, uh, a street of much higher quality. Um, now, when I present this, uh, when I present this uh, image, one of the main questions I get asked is, you know, this is great, but we're living in car-based societies and a lot of people have cars. So, you know, what do we do in the present? And uh, Yaya's thinking has been along this development uh, or an evolution of an idea which is kind of coming from a parking house uh, and, 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 and changing it into a mobility hub. Um, and, I, and I'll just explain some of these concepts uh, a little bit more. Um, but I think the fundamental one that I want to show is this image from, from one of our own mobility hubs located in the, in the northern harbour of Copenhagen. Um, and, and I show this image not to necessarily describe the building, but to actually show you the street that's in front of it. Um, so you'll notice firstly that there are no cars parked on the street, because in this new urban development, one of the strategies was that all that on-street parking would be consolidated into that parking house. And what that means is that you have much more space for trees, for bikes, and, and, and generally for people. Another aspect that we really tried to work with in this mobility hub was to try and think what other amenities could this building give back to the local neighbourhood. Um, so you'll see here um, that this was, a, this was a giant public space that we provided on the, on the roof, um, which not only provides new recreational facilities for families and, and the residents, but also active um, sports activities for the local um, CrossFit club uh, to use the space. Um, but I think, oh, one thing I really like to say with this image is that uh, the photo has actually been taken from one of the most expensive apartments in Copenhagen. And you can see there, it's pretty much the same view that the general public um, can access from exactly the same vantage point. And so we like to think that these kind of buildings create a more democratic use of the city. Um, but when we're talking about mobility hubs, uh, we should also not only consider the outside of the building, uh, but also what's happening on the inside. And one of the key uh, principles that we've been trying to work with with this idea of the mobility hub is the ground floor, where you can see it's not only a container for um, for private cars, but it's a curation of different mobility modes that support sustainable urban development in the area. Um, so you can see here, you know, there's shared cars, there's um, shared cargo bikes, um, there's drop-off space for, for ride hailing, but there's also a logistic center to allow people to interchange from large vans uh, into, into smaller cargo bike deliveries, as well as a, a, a cafe and, and, and a workshop for bicycles so that people can uh, fix their bike uh, in the neighborhood. And what this means is that these buildings, um, you know, start to just only take away uh, being a container for cars, but actually start to give back and are actually a vital piece of infrastructure in the, in, in the neighborhood to support urban life and sustainable mobility. Um, I would just end this presentation by uh, kind of outlining our uh, thoughts when it comes to parking houses and where we see it going in the future with these mobility hubs. And I start with this image just here, um, which, is, which is how we've built uh, parking houses traditionally. 
um, where it's a, a concrete structure, it's a very deep bay and, and very low floor to ceiling height. And what that means is that you can't actually reuse that building for anything apart from cars. You can't transform it into other types of, um, of, uh, of uses. And, and that's really bad when we're trying to transition away from cars but then still need that infrastructure for the moment. And, the example that I just showed you before was, was an evolution of this where it still has that similar structure but you know, you've provided the ground floor amenities to support urban life as, as well as the public space on the rooftop. Um, what Yaya is trying to develop now uh, in collaboration with a number of northern European cities is uh, timber uh, um, parking houses and, and, and what these structures do, um, they not only provide a more sustainable method for construction, being in timber, but because it's built out of timber, it's much more flexible in its reuse. So you can see here that um, uh, there's, there's kind of a shorter uh, depth uh, between the structure, between the columns. You have a, a much higher um, floor to ceiling height. And what that means is that as you start to transition away from private car ownership and you have different uses for that space, this same building can be transformed into commercial or residential functions. And so that means we don't have to necessarily decide of whether we're building uh, for cars or, or building for people. We can actually start to think of them as both. And these types of infrastructure as part of the transition between our current mobility systems and our future sustainable ones. Um, and, and I'll end my presentation there and just say, uh, if anyone wants to get in contact and talk to us uh, more about this, uh, I'd, I'd really enjoy it. Robert, um, I really enjoyed your insightful presentation and, you know, the images that you showed us. It makes me feel like I'm looking at a utopia city right now. And even the image of, you know, that really condensed um, uh, street with the, the parking issues and also uh, bicycles parked at the sidewalk. That's a normal orderly street from where I'm living at. I, I live in Berlin in particular mm -hmm. and um, perhaps the city was not planned for you know, cyclists or the amount of cyclists there are now, and many streets are you know now converted into bike lanes. Like streets that were meant for cars are now converted into bike lanes, and I think that has increased the quality of life for people in Berlin a little bit. But I wanted to ask you this: What do you think are the apprehension from policymakers to you know implement all of the images that you showed us? Is like okay, we don't really need that many parking spaces. Let's do park houses and let's make it more green. But how can we encourage policymakers globally, in fact, to implement this? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and I think that the main apprehension that yeah. a lot of uh, policymakers have is that throughout the 20th century, the car has been king. And we've seen such great economic development mm -hmm. because of the car. Mm -hmm. It unlocks so many social as well as economic opportunities for society. I think what we're experiencing now is this paradigm shift in the way we move in cities. Mm -hmm. So through automa um, yeah, automation, through digitization, um, we've seen like uh, the sharing economy uh, yeah. kind of come to light, which means that we can change from ownership models where it's my car to... Um, Our to car. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like uh, um, uh, servitization where we're accessing mobility rather than owning it. So it's like if I need to go 100 meters down the road, maybe I hire a scooter. If yeah. I need to drive 100 kilometers, I, I take a share car. Yeah. But what that means is that we have a far more um, efficient transportation system, which mm -hmm. kind of unlocks this space. And I think the more examples we have uh, of pilot projects as the ones I've just yeah. been trying to show uh, then, then we can actually start to convince these policymakers that yeah. we don't need to be scared about this future. We actually have a viable option to the transportation system that we have today. Yeah, but policymakers always look at you know what the people want. So, what about the apprehension from the regular person? You know, if I own a car, let's say I want the convenience. I want to be able to find a parking place uh, as easily as I did before in the, the past few years. But now everything has been converted into this green area, this public space. How do you think we can encourage people to accept this concept? Yeah, I, I think there's a number of different ways that you can do it. Um, I think the um, the pilot project that I tried to show before in, 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 the, um, in the Copenhagen street is mm -hmm. trying to shift the conversation away from what do I have to give up? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to give up my parking place, I have to give up my car, to what do I get? Do I get, a, you know, an urban environment that supports a, a much more livable 
uh, way of being in the city. Yeah. I would also say that as we start to shift um, to say a more efficient transportation system, those people that need a car actually get a better deal because all those trips that don't need to be taken by car mm -hmm. are removed, so the capacity is freed up uh, for other modes. So I think that it's, it's a delicate balance and I understand the apprehension that people have because it's, it's so ingrained in us. We can't actually yeah. think of cities without cars, but I think once we start to get more examples of, of, of positive ways of moving around cities, and you would have named Berlin, yeah. we've seen Paris, mm -hmm. London is moving this way, um, a number of examples in the United States as well through the, um, the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I think once people start to uh, realize that there are other ways of doing it, we'll, we'll be able to move in the right direction. Yep, and I suspect that, you know, putting the emphasis on climate change and how you can help on that front uh, kind of like makes it easier to encourage more people to adopt this shared economy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think sustainability is one thing, yeah. but I think it's also economic because a car in, in, in lots of places actually takes up a, a lot of people's salary. I yeah. mean, if we design cities around car use where people have to have a car and they don't have a lot of money, then yeah. they can't use that money for other things. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing is that the, the impact that cars have on our cities that mm -hmm. we only have to see all the uh, kind of residential streets that are just with, with cars parked everywhere and we can't use it for anything. Yeah. I think we'll, we'll actually be able to provide spaces that we enjoy much more of part of it. So I would say it's kind of three tiers um, that might help convince people. Right, well, uh, that was very insightful. I really enjoyed it. Um, we do have a little bit of time. Um, I think we have a question okay. from uh, one of our attendee and they're asking, what about older cities and these kind of ideas? So I did touch upon Berlin. It's an old city. Uh, it was rebuilt, but the space was limited. So how do you think that can, you know, your, your pilot project can be implemented in cities like this that are so old? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a very good question because in some ways designing new cities is a little bit easier. New urban developments, you know, we yeah. can create these parking houses, um, we can have these wide streets, we can put in bicycle lanes. Um, but, but I would just look at, at the old cities that are happening in Europe right now um, and, and they're being quite successful. Um, if we look at Ghent uh, in, in Belgium, mm -hmm. uh, if we look at Barcelona in, mm -hmm. in Spain, um, if we look at Oslo uh, in Norway, I mean these are all like old cities um, and where these pilot projects are happening are within the old medieval uh, kind of parts of the city and, and they're being very successful um, in, 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 in transitioning away from private car ownership. What I would say and, and what I try and advocate for actually with our work is that we can't have cookie, cu <laughs> cookie cutter approaches mm -hmm. uh, when we simply say take the bicycle lanes of Copenhagen and place them in say hilly San Francisco for instance. Yeah. Um, we need to actually think about what is the urban fabric of the city, what is the topography, what is the culture, and design quite specific responses. Mm -hmm. But I think that where we're at in terms of the technology we have in mobility, it actually allows us to be quite contextual with our approach. What about transport operators? How do you think they can assist in projects such as uh, this one? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, a lot of our work is based off this idea of mobility as a service, which I'm sure a lot of the, the people watching are aware of, um, because I think public transport is actually the, the, like, the key infrastructure needed for a successful mass um, system. We've seen it in Helsinki, um, where studies um, have shown that um, public uh, transport ridership actually increased with mass services, and they were both kind of integral pieces. Right. Uh, on the other side, I think that the new mobility technologies service that last mile problem that we all talk about, that, mm -hmm. that kind of barrier to getting people onto public transport. And we can think far in the future with autonomous vehicles servicing that, but right now we have, we have bikes, we have electric bikes, we have electric cargo bikes, we have yeah. scooters. And these are all those kind of new um, technologies that are then allowing us to trip chain and, yep. and not think of the car being an A to B, but rather this multimodal network that through the combination of different mobility modes, we can, we can service that trip in a, in a better way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time today, that insightful presentation and chatting with me. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. All right, we will be taking a very short break here in the International Mobility Summit, so don't go anywhere because coming up next, a very interesting topic that we did touch upon yesterday. We want to expand on it more coming up after this.
we're always moving further forward together. We're clearing the path for a car-free tomorrow. It's our turn to take the lead, to take a stand, to not just move, but to create a movement. We have a chance to make a change. Take it. Don't give an inch, take a mile and spark a revolution against pollution. Because if there's a chance to make it, having some fun along the way, wouldn't you take it? Take action. Take it on. Take it here. Welcome back. The theme on our next program is smart infrastructure to keep women walking in cities. I was surprised to hear in this summit that women actually walk more in their daily commute than men. But our needs as women are often not specifically considered in the design and management of public space and transport. Data in some cities suggest that when women can afford to or are presented with other options, we are choosing to walk less and increase private vehicle use. I suspect that safety or the lack of it is a main factor here and it's something I can relate to. So the good news is a project in Ireland is exploring how new technology can help identify what changes to infrastructure are required to better support women's needs when walking on the streets. To expand on this, I would like to introduce Bronwyn Thornton, CEO at Walk21. Bronwyn, I'll leave it to you to introduce your panel. Over to you. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning for this critical topic of talking about women and walking. And as you heard in the introduction, women are walking more, but are also choosing other modes as quickly as they can. And that was no more uh, apparent than in Ireland when they released um, a report earlier this year showing that women are motorizing and choosing uh, private vehicles over walking much more quickly than men. Women's travel journey style is very different from men. They trip chain, they, they move a lot more between different tasks with caring and shopping and work and, and home. And 
we need to understand what are the factors that influence women's movement and how comfortable they feel in our cities to enable them to continue to choose to walk. And the thing that I always really like to point out when we start talking about gender is that women are not a niche market here. This is not like a select moment. This is half the population. And if we make it safe for half the population, then they choose to walk and they will choose to walk with their children and influence those future travel decisions as well. I've got a great panel here today to talk about exactly this and the project that we're doing in Ireland um, with TU Dublin and the city of in the city of Dublin to look at women and their walking habits and how we can support them. I'm really pleased to introduce my panel, Marianne Weinreich, who is market manager at Rambolst Mobility and chair of cycling embassy of Denmark. Now, don't worry, she's not here to talk about cycling because she has done a fantastic report about gender and mobility and looked at the, the statistics around women walking. Uh, we have also Dr. Lorraine Darcy, who's senior lecturer in the School of Transport Engineering, Environment and Planning at TU Dublin. She did a PhD on walkability, one of the very first PhDs on walkability, and explored the diversity in the interpretation of the concept of walkability between different professions and how we design our neighborhoods and streetscapes and resultant mobility behaviors. And she'll be, she is supporting the research agenda with our project there in Dublin. And finally, Dr. Seth Stefan Steininger, he's currently in charge of the Spatial Data Infrastructure Observatory of the Chilean Centre for Urban Sustainable Development, known to us as Todayus. And he's our technical lead on the Every Step of the Way project, developing the app for women to report their walking experience. So with no more further ado, I'm very pleased to hand over to Marianne, who's going to give us an overview of the data from her recent report about gender and mobility. Welcome to the floor, Marianne. Um very happy to be here today and thank you very much for the invitation and uh, I'll just uh, jump uh, right into it. I hope you all see my screen. It is not changing. We do see your screen. Yeah. yeah, but it doesn't change when I click. Now it does. Yes. Great. Uh, the report that I'm going to share uh, the insights from is a report that we did in Smart Mobility. We cover these uh, seven countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Germany, India and Singapore in our team in Hamburg. And uh, we have been a team of men and women looking into data related to gender differences in transport. So today I would just like to give you a brief overview of gender differences and then deep dive into the walking data as you said, uh, Bronwyn, in the introduction. The study came out in March this year and has been done in cooperation with the Rambel Foundation, uh, HSL, which is public transport in Helsinki, um, SL, which is public transport in Stockholm, and VBB, public transport in Berlin, and then Trafikverket in Sweden. And uh, these partners also uh, indicate that this is a topic that is very important uh, also in, in many different sectors. Um, and the main conclusion basically is that Beside, uh, it's it's commonly known that transport is uh, trans, uh, transport is gender neutral, but it isn't. It is not. Actually, uh, it's been uh, established many times uh, by, uh, for instance, uh, the International Transport Forum under OECD that gender is one of the most robust determinants of transport choice. Uh, but in the transport sector this is not a common knowledge. So that was one of the things we wanted to highlight with this report, create some more knowledge and awareness about this topic. Just a very quick overview. As said, women, uh, looking at the data, we see that women walk more than men. Uh, men drive more than women. Women are more often passengers and women use public transport more than men. When it comes to cycling, uh, women uh, cycle less, and that's primarily because there's uh, many places lack of safe cycling infrastructure. And when I keep talking about men and women, I just want to point out that what I'm talking about here is what we see in the data. This does not mean that all women do this or all men, men do that. 
there are of course uh, uh, people that that have a different uh, behavior from what I'll point out. This is just what we see in the data. Also, as mentioned, um, men tend to have a simpler, uh, more A to B travel pattern, or often related to commuting. They often travel alone, while women travel shorter distances per trip than men, but have multiple stops and do what is referred to as trip chaining. Um, and also, as also mentioned, women to a great extent than men accompany children or other family members and can carry bags or groceries while traveling. Women also have a different experience when moving around uh, our cities. Uh, women to a much greater extent than men uh, fear harassment and assault. And that also um, has the consequence that women to a greater extent than men really think about the route and time of day that they are traveling. All these uh, differences in transport um, is kind of mirrored by the gender differences that we see in society in general, um, the, the more structural differences. The differences that we see, for instance, that women's work participation is still lower than men's, that women to a greater extent than men work part-time, uh, that women in general earn less than men, and that women in general have the majority of the parental leave. Um, all these factors uh, are influential in uh, producing the gender differences that we see in the transport and mobility sector. When it comes to walking, we looked into both the existing research, but also looked at motor speed data for walking in all the seven countries where we are working. And in all the seven countries, we could see that women walk more than men. As noted here, the data for Singapore, uh, both uh, walking and cycling is uh, mixed into one data set, which is why uh, um, the number for men uh, are higher. That's most of them cycling. When it uh, comes to walking, we also did a big survey with 3,500 uh, women and men in the seven capitals. Uh, looking into uh, associations uh, that they had with different modes, but also the challenges and concerns that they face traveling. And in the survey, we see that more women than men associate walking with active, while more men than women associate walking with slow. Both uh, women and men identify weather as one of the main challenges for walking. But we also see that women to a much greater extent than men identify traveling with groceries and bags and personal safety as a challenge and a concern while walking. Women to a much greater extent than men also uh, associated walking with Corona safe. Uh, the survey was done back in um, de December and that's why that uh, came up as uh, one of uh, the key concerns. But it also means that this could, uh, at least when we were at the peak here, uh, make women uh, go to, to cars uh, also. As also mentioned, uh, the, that feeling uh, of, of, of feeling unsecure or not safe also, if the possibility arises, will get uh, women uh, in the cars. I just want to mention public transport as well because walking and public transport are very strongly linked. Uh, women use public transport more than men and also around public transport uh, um, identify personal safety and fear of harassment and assault as a concern related to public transport. It is uh, related a lot to waiting at bus stops or train stations, but also inside the, the vehicles uh, themselves. Um, in the study, we also interviewed uh, 40 women from the seven capitals, and um, they almost gave identical testimonials about the strategies that they use and have developed over time when walking and using public transport at night. Everything from walking with keys in between the fingers 
uh, wearing big jackets, uh, making themselves bigger, having flat, changing to flat shoes from heels, for instance, to be able to walk and listening or pretending to listening to music to seem uninterested uh, in, in conversation. Um, it's related to their fears and experiences of harassment. But they also explained how the design of our streets and the bus stops and the stations influence their feeling of security. And there's a, a quote here about how some streets that feel very nice and cozy and welcoming at daytime, suddenly at nighttime, they feel uh, very unsafe uh, because there's maybe a lot of places where women feel that somebody, men, could be hiding. Um, and it also showed that especially technology really uh, is something that women use and feel that it can make them feel safe. Everything from route planning to having, uh, for instance, technologies where you can kind of uh, show your destination or your, uh, where you are, for instance, if you're a shared vehicle, um, and in general, um, communicate uh, where you are. It is a very, very short uh, and fast uh, one through of the report that is publicly available, but it was just kind of to, to introduce some of the findings that I now know that the next speakers will follow up on and have more detailed uh, presentations about. So thank you very much for uh, having me here. Um, there are some conclusions, but I don't think I have more time, so I'll just... Uh, Stop it here. The main point is don't victimize women, but include their needs and concerns in planning, not as an add on, but as an incorporated part of the projects. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, Marianne. That is, is the oversight that we need and the understanding um, about the impact um, of women's experience in public space and how we have to integrated into our thinking about transport and how we move. I'm very pleased now to pass to Lorraine and she is going to talk about that public space challenge. Uh, the floor is yours, Lorraine. How are you going with screen sharing? Okay. <laughs> Thanks Thank very you. much. I think, um, uh, sure. Okay, hopefully you can see that now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, yes, thanks very much for the opportunity. So as Brahman said, um, my PhD work was on walkability, and um, and I think there's one thing that like oh sorry, from an Irish context, just wanted to say that a lot of what Marianne has said there is what we are after finding in, in recent studies that have been done in Ireland, both our Transport Infrastructure Ireland um, report, which Brahman mentioned already about um, traveling in a women's sho women's shoes, but also. We're part of the Diamond Horizon 2020 project around um, gender and intersectionality and use of um, different transport modes, but working and using public transport modes. And um, so, you know, and a lot of it is intuitive. If you speak to any woman in your life, <laughs> you will you will know that um, these are things that we all experience. That we have our, our different um, strategies that we use as well. But it's important for us to understand how to design for those. Because there's been there like there's been a, a lack of knowledge in relation to that. So one of the things that we needed to do is to understand what is walkability and how do we deliver it. And um, in Ireland, we are in a very um, great position that our national government has been made a commitment to investing heavily in walking and cycling over the next number of years, 365 million euro per year. And one of the main questions we get asked, but how do we? What do we need to do for walkability and how do we design for that? So coming back to my work on walkability. One of the first things, um, there we go. Um, I found when it, so it is inter intersectionality or interdisciplinary study asking different professions in focus groups that were mixed um, what they thought walkability meant. And on, through those findings, we found that engineers tended to focus on the movement. And it was like they put the value on footpaths, on lighting, on cycle paths, costing facilities, et cetera. And then we found that whereas urban designers and architects were much more likely to put a place function. And, you know, it's really important that we we understand that place is like informs the sense of how we feel in a space. So, you know, and movement doesn't always tell us just because people are moving through that space doesn't mean they're necessarily feeling safe and comfortable in that space as well. Um, I've often found physical activity researchers um, and then our local representatives of politicians understood the term as having a place to go for a walk. So it was about recreational provision. 
um, not necessarily thinking about our streets being a place you could go for a walk for recreation. And, you know, there was a lot of research out there where they were monitoring physical activity and they're like, OK, there's more vigorous physical activity and more walking happening in these places. These must be successful places. But that could actually be an indication that people were not feeling comfortable in that space, but they needed to walk there. So they were pretty much running through it to get out of there fast. So we needed to break down what it is that made somewhere walkable. It's somewhere that's permeable, legible, so we can understand it and we can move through it, easy to move through. It is well connected, so we have lots of different options and reflects pedestrian desire lines. That's the, the places that people want to cross roads and where they want to go. And as I already mentioned, I think a few times that um, every public transport trip involves a walking trip. Every shared mobility trip involves a walking trip. So it's really important for the success of any of these modes that we have good walkability catchments and good walkability around those areas. And people feel comfortable on streets where the traffic is designed to move down to walking speed. And a lot of the conversation around new technologies does relate to that relative speed of the vehicles on the street and the comfort of those in the streets. So when we talk about the needs of an individual and what makes the place walkable, we, it's, it's the physical, it's the social, it's the land use characteristics. It's a really complex, um, considerations for an individual to decide whether or not they feel comfortable and if that street meets their needs. So we, we, there's a lot of factors to understand. So, um, and also one that I always like to point out is that we've mentioned crime and a constant fear of violent crime. Um, women is constantly, are constantly reporting this. Um, and also when I speak about women, I'm talking about trans community as well, or anybody um, who, you know, can ad identifies as a woman or feels a bit different, feels it looks a bit different or um, can be victimized in a similar way. But one of the findings in the study in Cork City here in Ireland found that it is not necessarily about what the place looks like right now, that there can be an historic association with place. So a crime may have happened at a location decades ago. But if people associate that place with somebody getting attacked or, or something happening there, they might still not use it. So it's not enough for us necessarily to, to understand, the, to go out and audit a street in itself. We need to talk to people and understand what it is about that street. And it may be a historic association. So we, we put pedestrians first on our hierarchies. This is from the Irish Design Manual for Urban Roads and Streets. But the thing is that like, you know, we have policies in place around this. We need to keep streets moving. There needs to be an equity in how we use that space because right now there's a lot of um, public space being used for private um, private property storage. And you know we need to have more equitable space and make sure that there is plenty of space for walking. But unfortunately, um, you know this is written back in 1961, but automobiles are more easily understood and satisfied than the complex needs of cities. So it's easy for us to consider the automobile and the movement of an automobile versus the movement of people and their needs. And so we often end up with this in our cities, causing severance, meaning that people can't walk. They, they, they cause, they cut off whole sections of cities when we have roads like this. And um, so it's just, just an introduction to the traveling in a woman's shoes. I urge you all to have a look at it. Um, like Marianne's report, there's lots of really great information out there now in relation to gender and mobility. Um, the Diamond Project, as I mentioned already, so there was four case uses in that project. And just some of the key things that were noted, that there was differences when it came to the convenience um, of the travel systems between males and females, and whether or not you, they had dependents traveling with them, particularly dependents under the age of five. And female participants give a greater um, give a greater weighting to the sense of place of a location, how they felt in that place. Um, and also that the need for transport network to merge with other form of local transport. So that those connections, the interconnections between modes of moving around. And um, so living with dependents or traveling with dependents so that caring trips was an important determinant in how they saw the space and how useful the space was. But they also wanted to feel like they were they didn't necessarily need to have a guard or there, like or a police a policeman there, but it was more that they felt like there was, if they needed help, they could access that help. And um, we've already seen some actions taken by some public transport um, um, providers off the back of some of the information that was found. And as I mentioned earlier, that there was significant differences in the three countries that the surveys were take place 
in the reporting of previous discrimination for appearance across all categories and non-binary re respondents reporting a greater discrimination. So, you know, in the, in the conversation about gender, we need to think about the intersectionality as well. And I just love this one. So I'm always going to share it. It's important that we provide good quality infrastructure. The, the better the infrastructure that's there, the more people we're going to have that will use it. So thanks very much. Great, thank you, Lorraine. It's a really great oversight on how we perceive space differently, how we use space differently, and the importance of understanding those differences for um, delivering on safe space. I'm very pleased now to pass to Stefan, who's going to talk about the tool we're developing to help women communicate their experience of the spaces in Dublin, particularly associated with access to that public transport that you highlighted as critical for supporting those walking journeys. Thank you, Stefan. Hello everyone and thank you for the invite. So I'm happy to present the tool we are developing for the project in Dublin, but not only for Dublin. So what is the tool? Fairly simple. It's a smartphone app, or that's what we call a, the walkability app. And what you see on the left is a basically a design shot. So it's not as it is right now, but it's where we want to go. But we are fairly close as you see in the next screenshot. So this is what we have right now. And what's the objective of this app is to allow pedestrians to report their walking experience. So while you walk, you should tell us or should tell city who hopefully collaborates uh, how you feel while walking. So, and for that, we actually use a fairly simple traffic light evaluation system where we hope this is also fast. So you see here the buttons, there's a green button with a smiley face. And there's also a yellow and a red button and uh, the red is more the, the sad face. So that means here needs to be some action. Mm -hmm. So how did we get there? How did we came up with the tool? Uh, because uh, we were thinking, so if you want to improve pedestrian infrastructure in Dublin, for instance, what do we need to know uh, is where are the problems, right? So, and then there's the next step is uh, if you want to think about solutions, we need to know, so who is actually having an issue and what is the issue at hand? Because what might happen, you know, you, you see that someone is reporting, so this corner, we have a problem here with traffic or something. And if you imagine there's a young engineer who just graduated from university, who's able to walk, you know, so he goes to the crossing and says, so, well, it looks everything perfect to me, right? So, but if he knows uh, there might be a mom with a child uh, or someone disabled uh, who needs to cross uh, this, this road, then, this perspective may be a bit different. So uh, thinking about these questions, uh, we also know somehow that we are all kind of experts on walking and most of us nowadays own a phone. So the solution to the where is that uh, we may develop an app for neighbors and experts uh, using the phone's GPS. And to know a bit more about the people who, who actually would walk and tell us, uh, we have to ask in that same app, uh, the opinion of people, so that's the red, yellow, and green button, and also to ask about the context, so gender, age, and uh, maybe how able you are actually to work. So uh, we did a pilot project, and in, in 2018, we, we developed a, a pilot app, which we called Stride uh, for Android. Um, so this app uh, included uh, this traffic light approach, as you see, on, on the right side of the screen. Uh, it uh, provided a basic user context. So we asked the person for each point to say uh, what gender you are, what is the age group or ability, your ability. And we focused basically on, on one question which covers three aspects. So as you see, uh, the question is, is this place safe, nice and easy? So, so we, uh, this free safe, nice and easy uh, uh, respond to, to safety, uh, so safe versus risky, street design, which is nice versus unfriendly, and also infrastructure, so easy versus difficult. So, and you know, you may wonder why also infrastructure, because at, su at some point, you know, you may have been in the suburbs in, in the United States or in Canada, uh, and you have seen that there may be roads without any sidewalk. So not, not only in underdeveloped uh, regions. Uh, uh, after developing the stride up, uh, we did some case studies, five of them, 
Uh, and one was particular done in, in Medellin in Colombia. So where we did, uh, or not we, but the Funda Piaton, so local organization did work with children, uh, 50 children. And we, they used the app as you see in the lower screen, but also as there was five children in a group and two adults. So that was not thought that each child should have a phone. Uh, they used this, uh, these smiley faces uh, to, to indicate how they like the spot where, where they stopped. So at the very end, we got a nice map with 2,500 experiences. Uh, and basically the red dots outline the problems and the green ones, uh, these are crossings where, which have been fine. So there was no intervention needed. And what was very positive here is that the city actually uh, put in some money and improved pedestrian infrastructure. So, uh, but when we, when we look at the five studies we did in different countries, so in Colombia and in, in Chile and Nigeria and also in Bangladesh, um, uh, what have been the results with respect to that pilot application? So we knew about the where, we knew who has a problem, uh, but it wasn't so clear what's the problem. That's what I should seen on the red side. So in our Lagos study, Lagos in Nigeria, uh, we got this uh, red dot map with negative 89% neg negative experience. And we didn't know what's actually going on, you know, when you just look there. And when someone sends screenshots and you see, you know, a sidewalk, uh, which, which is existing, but uh, the quality is not that good. So it's about maintenance. Uh, other information, so we, we knew when, so we could also, we got the time information. Uh, the, the choose model, so safe, nice and easy, seemed to work well. However, the apps appear, if you remember the screenshot, so it wasn't very good. And also we had no iPhone version, which was asked for uh, in the Western world. Uh, so based on these experiences, uh, we, we redeveloped a second product or a second version, so which is the new walkability app. So we ask here more also uh, about the what or what, what's, what's the background of the person. So is, is your walk uh, a choice walk or is a necessity, necessity? And also about group size. So are you working with, with, with uh, children or with other people? And then uh, also with the free buttons, they have not been only re not replaced in that sense, but we, we added more details so we can, you can give a detail what you don't like or what you actually like in that spot. So, um, we are still developing, but the first version is out on the app store, it's not yet approved. We need to do some, some details here um, because of the location data use. Um, but we, we are looking forward to use it in Dublin. So back to Bronwyn. Thanks, Stefan. That's a great insight, as you can see how we have developed the app over time in response to the, the needs of the community and of the local authorities that responded to the results of the apps, particularly in Lagos and in Medellin, and actually came along, assessed the interventions and built some of the improvements that needed to happen in response to um, what was discovered during that uh, community consultation. So we're looking forward to doing this work in uh, Dublin in the fall with, between now and Christmas. Um, and uh, stay in touch with us to find the results. We'll be reporting those in um, to the to the Polis Conference in December, the initial findings, and this will be rolling out and ongoing through next year to Walk 21 in Ireland, um, where we'll be hosted by TU Dublin in September. So it's an it's an emerging and evolving project. And if you'd like to be involved, then you're you're very welcome. I'd like now to go to some discussion with our panelists. I've got a couple of uh, questions. We've got about ten minutes left. Uh, to talk about this. And I would like perhaps to start back with you, Marianne, because I think it's really interesting, this challenge to switch people out of this idea that transport is gender neutral. And Lorraine made a very interesting observation that engineers think about movement and lineal and that, that planners and urban designers think about place. And we also find that place is more of the function for uh, that, that women are responding to um, in their work. So having done the research, having found all of this out, how do we mainstream the needs of women into transport planning um, and delivery? How do we shift this dynamic that hasn't necessarily been serving women as well? It's a hard ask, I know, but perhaps you've got some ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very hard question, because I think we are just starting right now. We uh, also, with this report, we just try to give our small contribution to a huge issue um, that 
is seems to be uh, become a hot topic now as of 2021. I think it's also based upon the whole Me Too movement that we in general now can speak about gender difference uh, in another way that we could before. But I also think the solutions are many and they are um, in many different sectors. We need to look at the structural uh, differences also. We cannot necessarily influ influence them. So we, what we can do in the transport sector is to look, I think, at all the levels from building a team, you know, to really looking at, is this team gender balanced? Do we have both men and women and, and in, in general, diverse, uh, is it a diverse team? Uh, to, to moving up the chain that we need more women uh, in decision-making positions because we see in public transport organizations, in boards, uh, in, in, the big, in big companies, we see it, it is male-dominated. And also within the transport sector in general, it's 80% uh, men. And, and there is this unconscious bias that means that we are planning more for the male uh, travel patterns and preferences in transport. And we need some mechanisms that prompt us every day, all of us, because if you have a brain, you're biased and we cannot help it. Um, it's, yeah. it's part of who we are. So we need mechanisms that prompt us to think about this and include this on all levels. Yeah, I think that's really great because we are all used to the system a certain way and we're all comfortable with that and or uncomfortable as, as the case may be. So perhaps I could uh, come to you Lorraine with um, uh, also probably a slightly difficult question, but very often people feel that they're going to lose something if we start thinking more about women and how, how, how they travel. Do you see that this sort of shift that needs to happen, are we gonna have to trade it off against the needs of men or is it that we can find a compatible middle ground in the way that we design our, our, uh, our space? Can we find that happy balance between movement and place um, and, and meet the needs of gender, all of, the, all of uh, the different genders? Or do we have to actually say women feel the most vulnerable so therefore they take a priority? How do you, how do you see that working? So I, I think what's really important is um, the narrative around change. Um, because people fear, fear change and it, that if they feel like something has been taken away from them, if that is amplified in the media, because we see it, particularly here in Ireland, and I'm not sure how other people are um, experiencing this worldwide, but a lot of the narrative in the media is about taking away car spaces, taking like delays in traffic and not enough emphasis put on like this will improve, you know, your access to your local services. This will help you the local economy because there's more people walking past the door. This will, um, like, I, I love some of the studies that, you know, for example, in Toronto, they've they found that there's an eight-year delay in the onset of dementia in high, more highly walkable neighborhoods. You know, there's, you know, there's more social, like um, Donald Dappenyard and um, Joshua Hart's work about, you know, people know their neighbors more, therefore better mental health outcomes, the more walkable, the less, more people can meet their neighborhoods. The more uh, car dominated suburbs we build, the less likely people are to know um, their neighbors because you walk out your door, you sit in your car. Um, so I think the narrative is a really important thing because that, then everybody um, a much more equal um you know ownership of space and i think ownership is an, another really important part of it we don't talk enough about those people that do not go to work every day outside of the home i should say and we want to clarify that but if, particularly older people people with disabilities and we all have universal we all experience universal uh, design moment in our lives uh, that's a little cannibal read use that one i love it that you know there are times in our lives when we have like greater mobility needs than others there are times that one the way we would have normally chose to move around changes and and that is more amplified for women when we experience pregnancy, when the caring roles that we have and older age and the greater risk of osteoporosis and, and, and falls. So it is it is about equity across the life, the life course. And it is about us refocusing the narrative. And, you know, we are 50 percent of the population. Um, more than 50% of the population, we're actually, there's more of us, um, uh, but our needs aren't always met and that we need to just restructure the, the narrative. 
Great. Thank you, Lorraine. I think that's really interesting. We have to work against unconscious bias and we have to reframe um, the narrative. So let's get down to some practicality, Stefan. You're working with this tool. We are going to be trialing it in Dublin, but it's possible that other cities around the globe can adopt this. You've already mentioned uh, a number of other cities. Is it going to be available in other languages? How do people come on board with the project? What are the, what are the challenges for, for going global and, and, and how, how are we taking it forward in that respect? Yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> so, uh, as for the others, it's not an easy question to answer. So we hope to roll it out uh, at the global scale at some point. But we discovered already now some challenges, as you say, so languages, translation, even though that we try to work with icons, but we also figured that, you know, uh, if you think, so we designed this up for just an Irish context and also from a Chilean perspective here. So, but if you think you want to use the app in India, so then maybe the icons need to be different. And also, when I just watched also Marianne's talk, uh, and she said that weather was a concern for many, I was like, well, here in Santiago de Chile, so we have like almost all the time we have sun. So weather is of some concern, but it wouldn't be 60%. And, and also related to that, for instance, we, we got the a, a question already from Norway. So they ask us, could there be an icon about snow plowing? So you, you need to do some snow plowing. And we're like, well, how do we do that? So we were thinking that we may need to develop kind of local version, local icon sets um, for, for maybe different climates or different regions of the world. But it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Huh? So, so we hope to go global, but we will need to see and, and consult local experts. So. I think this is a really good point that 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 uh, walking is deeply local. It's our very personal experience on the streets wherever we are, and so anything that is a global opportunity has to reflect that and be able to to respond to that. But I don't think we should be shy of that. I mean, road infrastructure, transport, and traffic engineering has had decades of development and detailed design um, work about what pavements to use in hot weather or what you know the the setting rates for tar in the in, in colder climates. So so I don't think we need to be shy of investing in understanding these things and delivering better walking environments for everybody. Our time is nearly at an end. So I'm not going to open a new question because we are um, literally in the last minute. I do want to just take the opportunity to thank everyone for the for the perspective today and highlighting not only the importance of addressing the needs of women when we think about our cities and how we move, but some of the ways that we can do that and the things that we have to get, the defaults that we have to start uh, guarding against around that unconscious bias. And I look forward to that new narrative taking us forward and uh, changing the experience for women. So thank you to my panelists and thank you to Electronomous for having us here today. Thanks. Thank you, Bronwyn, for that very insightful discussion with your panel and thank you for the good work that all of you do. Thank you. Okay, so from walking, let's move to cycling. Social distancing has resulted in a global cycling boom since 2020. In this session coming up, we will be asking the speakers to picture cycling and tell us what do they see, what do they wish to see, and what do they foresee. So, all speakers that are coming up are a part of the Women in Cycling Network, and we are so proud to have them on board as this network is committed to ensure that the diverse experiences of women are taken into account and represented in decision-making bodies, projects, and processes that affect the sector. So please welcome this session's moderator, Angela van de Kluf. International Strategic Advisor of Cycling, Education, Engagement, Traffic Education and Policy, Planning and Research at Mobicon. Angela. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thank you all for joining the Women in Cycling panel on the future of cycling. And uh, yeah, cycling has become more popular in the last decade and it results in a global cycling boom. Uh, this session, I ask our panelists what they see for the future of cycling. And when I Googled images um, on the future of cycling, let me share my screen with you. Um, this is what I saw. Um, and 
where is that? Um, I was wondering, these images, is that the future of cycling? Whose future does this represent? Oh, and um, I'm curious whether we will see similar images from our panelists today. Um, so I'm pleased to moderate this panel as a part of Women in Cycling Network. And uh, this month, we've already held two uh, in-person networking events. And this summer, we are also a member of the Women in Transport platform. Uh, we also have a digital booth if you want to learn more. So the format for this panel is that I will introduce the first panelist who then shares her view on the future of cycling. And then I introduce the second panelist who also shares her view, etc. And after we've heard all six panelists with their views, uh, we have some time for reflection and we can discuss some synergies. So let's go with it. Uh, our first panelist is Jocelyn Kemker de Kruijf. She's an independent entrepreneur, enthusiastic cycling promoter at the Office for Bicycle Promotion called Triple Joy. She calls herself a velologist and helps people to realize their dreams and goals, featuring the bicycle as a connecting tool. She's an expert on community building and cycling stimulation with a creative mind. Jocelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angela, for this uh, nice introduction and moderating this session. Um, F030 op de fiets uh, is an active platform and literally visualized cycling in Amersfoort and the surrounding area, puts it on the map in the Netherlands. We do this by setting up challenges for experiments and filming them. It allows us to create content and actively share it in the network. Uh, I had a YouTube link as an uh, example. Nodrien at the Fiets also actively involves residents and local parties and creates a climate of participation. In this way, a community around the bicycle is actively built. It is unique because it is accessible, local, approachable, fluid, enthusiast, anchored, and activates with a positive vibe. As a result, it is not a remote and it's easier to develop chains and connecting in our region. One of the experiments we conducted is the bike versus car challenge. We noticed that if we help people and provide information, they started to think more about their own mobility. For example, many residents have sold their car, hand in uh, their car or bought a bicycle. Not because we pushed it, but because people start to think more about themselves. On short distances, it makes a huge difference if people opt in for the bicycle. The only question is, will we see more room for cycling in cities and towns in the future? Uh, thank you for uh, listening and I'm handing it over back to you, Angela. Thank you, Jocelyn. And Probably for our audience, it's interesting to hear that in the Netherlands, there is a challenge bike versus car because, you know, we are famous for our cycling. So maybe we talk about that more in a bit. Um, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Cecil Onur Yakan, co-founder of Bicicleti Kadin Initiativi, my Turkish language is, is not very well developed. It means Women on Bicycle Initiative. And amongst many things cycling related, Cecil is the co-founder of Biciclet Gezgini, Turkish first touring bicycle shop. After commuting for 10 years by bicycle in Istanbul, Turkey, and three years in Athens, Greece, she is now pacing the streets of Padova, Italy, on her bicycle as a mobility studies master's student at the University of Padova. Cecil, go ahead. Hello, thank you, Angela. Uh, okay, this is my photo for the future of cycling. Uh, I took this photo four years ago in Nijmegen, Netherlands, during the Velocity Conference. And look at them. You know, I like this photo a lot because they look so lively. They don't need care. They are carefree. They look happy. Uh, did you notice the baby on the back uh, of the mother? No, it is like they are in their living room. 
uh, he she, the mother just puts the baby on her back just as they are in their living room and you see the boy the boy is looking at me maybe he wonders why i am taking their photos because for them it's a very normal thing but for me as angela said uh, 10 years i commuted by bicycle in istanbul and uh, uh, three years in Athens, and I had never uh, had this feeling of confidence like them when I was cycling in the cities uh, I lived. Because uh, in Turkey, when you buy a bicycle from a shop, they give you two things, but these two things not uh, a lock or uh, you know some tools for your bicycle. These two things are a helmet and a high visibility jacket, because it is not safe uh, everybody believes it is not uh, safe to cycle in the city. Yes, I also agree. Yes, I dare to cycle in these big cities uh, because I wanted to cycle. I believe in commuting by bicycle will make my city uh, more livable. Anyway, uh, yeah, as a summary, <laughs> Uh, in Turkey, when people want to cycle, they are afraid of the cars, uh, they are afraid of the infrastructure, they are afraid of the prejudice of the people because cycling is not for adults or for, uh, you know, logical people. It is a kind of adventure or it's a kind of war between uh, you and the cars. We are here because we want our uh, skills will be more livable, not threatening. Thank you. Thank you, Cecil, and, and thank you for showing us this beautiful picture and at the same time explaining, you know, the challenges you face uh, in the areas where you uh, live or, or used to live. Um, now, the next panelist uh, is Anna, Dr. Anna Nikoleva, Assistant Professor in Urban Mobility Fears at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on futures of mobility and transitions to more sustainable and inclusive mobility. Her main fascination is the meaning that individuals and communities give mobility and how that meaning shapes our social, spatial environments, economies, and cultures. Anna, explain us, what is this picture? What is your view? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Angela, for this introduction. So I actually chose uh, to show you an image of the future that I do not consider desirable, yet I found it important to show it because I think uh, it is um, popular, rather popular in certain circles. My niche is um, in terms of cycling, uh, studying cycling is cycling and technology. And in the last 10 years, we see a lot of smart technology being introduced into cycling, upgrading bikes, upgrading infrastructures and so forth. And uh, we see that with that uh, integration of cycling and technology, that a vision, a particular vision of the future of cycling is being promoted where the bike is essentially a replacement for the car uh, that uh, it is promoted as a car, but just uh, more efficient, but also smart, uh, just as fast, uh, helps you to get from A to B as quick as possible. And this image that I took from an article represents that vision. Um, however, I argue that this is a very, uh, reductive vision. This is not, this uh, vision may uh, take us to a future where we actually lose what is so wonderful uh, about the cycling as a social practice, as an inclusive practice, as a practice that we do uh, together that gives us unique social and sensory experiences. And instead it may put cycle on a path where uh, the bike is just a new car, an isolated, efficient, uh, fast experience of uh, going from A to B on your own. And that is also uh, very much facilitated by technology. A lot of data is gathered and so forth. So I wonder if that's the future we want to uh, go to. And that's why I found it impos important to share as a critical scholar of uh, technology. Um, I also must say that uh, choosing an image of desirable future of cycling is quite challenging because I think the desirable futures are very different for will be and will be futures very, will be very different for different places. I live in Amsterdam. You see it in the backdrop uh, of. Uh, 
my background image and I can say, you know, this should be the future for everyone. This is wonderful. But I don't think so. I think that there, is, there are ma many wonderful futures for many uh, social groups, for many places. And I'm very curious uh, also about the images that others will share in a moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Interesting. And um, uh, also interesting how um, bikes replace cars uh, in your image. Thank you for making uh, us aware of, of these trends that are happening. And so um, let's move on to the fourth panelist, Melissa Brundlett, uh, my colleague, international communication specialist at Mobicom and co-author of two books, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality, as well as Curbing Traffic, the human case for fewer cars in our lives. Melissa uses her experience as a writer, marketer, and media producer to share the human perspective of multimodal transport to a mainstream audience. Melissa, go ahead. Thanks, Angela. Uh, it's lovely to be speaking uh, on this panel of other uh, very accomplished women. So thank you for including me. Uh, today, I wanted to um, take what Mobicon's mission is in terms of making the world uh, less dependent on the car and sort of boil that down into a future of cycling that revolves around three words, inclusion, diversity, and accessibility. Uh, and I wanted to focus this way because I want us to challenge what our traditional views of cycling are and try to move uh, past that in this future of cycling that a lot of us are working towards. And when I say inclusion, what I mean is in order for cycling to grow, we need to start including all types of people in cycling. And that does happen in some places, but uh, oftentimes the view of cycling or the image of cycling that's presented is not as inclusive as the world around us, or at least that it should be. An inclusive cycling is really open to people of all ages, but also all abilities, all genders and all races. And in fact, the future of cycling should be a place where it isn't remarkable to see people that don't look like us on bicycles and really seeing the diversity of our city reflected on people moving around on, on cycling. Uh, and that leads into my second uh, word of choice, which is diversity. And of course, uh, inclusion in, in terms of types of people and backgrounds is part of diversity. But what I mean here is diversity of the cycles that we see on the street. Uh, so thinking about all the different ways that people can use cycles to get around and not just the traditional two wheel type, be they hand cycles, adaptive cycles, uh, tricycles, quadricycles, any other type of uh, human or partly human powered machine that gets us around. If we make more room for that in our cities, then we allow for more diversity of use of cycles to uh, get, a, get around and experience our world. And finally, that leads into accessibility. And for me, um, when I think about the future of cycling, all the people and all the cycles that I, I mentioned before need to also have access to the city, be that through social, economic, or leisure activities, all the ways that we participate in society, that we make those social connections with each other, uh, to be able to allow all types of cycles and all types of people to have access to those opportunities is really important in this future of cycling. Uh, and also recognizing that um, in terms of disability, often we view these adaptive machines as the way that people that have disabilities access the city, but also understanding that bicycles or cycles of all types are a tool for mobility for people with in invisible disabilities that you can't tell how they're what might be wrong with them, but it gives them that opportunity for access. So all told, all of these work together to really provide people with uh, means to be a part of society, to have that social connection, to have that economic connection and really create a more inclusive, diverse and accessible cycling future. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Melissa, and, and really nice. Um you know, to, to share the three words and, and explain what you, what you mean by them and then capture it in, in one picture. Um, yeah, that's really uh, helpful. And so uh, we move to the fifth panelist, Florence Grégoire, a Eurofellow communications assistant at the European Cyclist Federation. She leads on the European Certification Standard, a methodology developed by the ECF to assess the quality of cycling routes, 
to evaluate and certify Eurovelo routes. Uh, she believes that promoting cycling tourism is a great way to motivate people to cycle, more people to cycle, and to bring a change to the way we travel. So I'm curious, um, let's see, the, I need the next slide. Curious, uh, Florence, to hear from you um, and tell us about this slide. Thank you, Angela. Um, so my future for cycling, and in particular for cycling tourism, relies on uh, diversity. Um, so many different offers for a diversity of uh, cycling travelers because cycling tourism can actually take so many different shapes. And I see this, first of all, by looking at the present uh, and at the key trends that we can see in cycling tourism at the moment. Uh, first of all, cycling tourism is booming and it has been uh, doing so in the last decade, but the COVID crisis really acted as an accelerator. Uh, and this boom results in a diversity of offers in terms of the available routes, uh, difficulties, services, and that attracts a growing variety of cyclists as well. And another key trend is the increasing economic impact of cycle tourism. So for instance, it doubled in five years on the Eurovelo 6 cycle route in France. Then there is the growth of the e-bikes. Uh, they are the biggest drivers of the bicycle market search, and they make cycle tourism accessible to a wider population as well, and more remote or hilly areas. And then the development of intermodality, uh, that's also a key trend because more bicycle transportation is becoming possible in trains and buses, even though it takes some time to, to happen. And under the right passengers' rights and obligation regulation, all new and refurbished trains in the EU will have to offer dedicated spaces for at least four bicycles. Then finally, there is the trend of the digital information. So the statistics show that internet is now by far the main source for choosing a cycle tourism destination. And building upon those trends, uh, I foresee that cycle tourism will keep booming in the years to come uh, because the COVID crisis has sparked, of course, a lot of suffering, but also a window on a different kind of life, uh, something less busy, uh, less running around with no time to think, and also more connection to nature and to those around us. So I think that it has brought uh, a real shift in perception, and that now an increasing number of people uh, was traveling. Uh, and also the younger generation is now much more connected and much more uh, aware of the climate crisis than previous generations. They also have a yearning for adventure or something, uh, looking for, for joy in the traveling. So I think cycling tourism can be a very good fit uh, for them, but uh, provided that it, the routes are safe, that uh, the information is available and so on. So that brings me to what I really wish to see in maybe 10 years or as soon as possible, which is which would be an open Europe, an Europe that is really open with an extensive network of cycling routes that are well connected, safe, that can be accessed by public transport, that this public transportation allowed for the carrying of bicycles, uh, and also a tourism sector that really puts in the, in the heart uh, this uh, sustainability, hospitality, real encounters, real discoveries, and that is, of course, one represented by the bicycle. And most importantly, I wish for uh, a large and diversity, diversified cycling population that really can be confident in their own skills to travel by bike, uh, that they think they have the freedom of cycles and the kind of services that they need for that. Uh, so thank you. I hand over to you. Thank you, uh, Florence, for, for taking it. Us on like on a trip, um, you know, on what cycling tourism is about, what you know, what your focus is, and uh, yeah, for showing us inspirational pictures of what is possible uh, on on bikes uh, uh, in your leisure time. Um, yeah, so our sixth and last panelist for today is Ayla Tanaka, who's from, uh, she's the winter city planner for the city of Edmonton in Canada. Um, she got up really early to, to share her views with us. I'm very thankful to her. Um, she studied natural resources and environmental studies and explored outdoor recreation spaces in winter cities. Um, she has presented on winter life and design in North America, Asia, and Europe and help plan two 
international winter cities conferences. I need the next slide. Um, Ayla sits on the international board of the Winter Cycling Federation. Ayla, take us along. Thank you, Angela. I would like to see the future of cycling extend to all seasons. In many Canadian cities, winter cycling is seen as a radical sport performed mainly by men. We are starting to see a change though. And the key to that change is safe cycling infrastructure. In my city, Edmonton, Canada, we have developed a strategy to recognize and embrace the fact that we are a winter city. We have snow on the ground for about six months of the year. Winter is often used as an excuse to not do something. It's too cold, it's too icy, it's too dangerous, but it doesn't have to be that way. Cycling in general was starting to grow in Edmonton pre-COVID, but as in many places, it has really grown over the last year and a half. We are seeing more people of all ages and abilities riding, and e-bikes are, prov are proving very popular, especially with older adults. Edmonton is a pretty typical North American city that is built around the car. When we first introduced bike lanes several years ago, we had the typical North American lines painted on the road. We ran a pilot project to clear some of those lanes in winter, but we realized fairly quickly that we just couldn't keep them clean. The snow and the slush from the cars was thrown into the bike lanes. And the pilot was seen as a failure until we stepped back and realized that protected separated bike lanes might work better. And we now have a growing network of these separated cycle tracks. And what we've noticed is that we're seeing a lot more women and children riding, not only in summer, but in winter too. We've learned from other winter cities that cold temperatures are not the main deterrent for cycling in the winter time. Safety is. And since women are in general, more risk averse than men, if we provide safe cycling infrastructure, women will cycle more. The other thing we've learned is that we need to maintain the bike lanes in winter and that maintenance needs to be predictable. If the lanes aren't predictably clear of snow, people will stop cycling. In Edmonton, the bike lanes are now top priority in our snow clearing policy along with the arterial roads. And this means that they're often cleared in the morning even before the sidewalks. What I've noticed as I cycle to work in the winter is that the cleared bike lanes are actually becoming mobility lanes for pedestrians and people who use mobility aids. And since women in general walk and take transit more than men, the bike lanes are supporting women in other ways too. So in order to keep women cycling throughout the year, we need to plan for our climate and weather patterns. We need to provide safe infrastructure and we need to keep it clear of snow. We had our very first fancy women bike ride in Edmonton last weekend. It was a fun ride with women and girls of all ages and taking back their place in the public realm. And I'm looking forward to seeing that reclaiming of space grow in all seasons too. Thank you. Thank you, Isla. And, and yeah, uh, interesting, you know, to have this different perspective from, from a city where winter is very uh, prevalent and also to see your uh, picture of the fancy women bike ride in Edmonton. Uh, it's a movement that actually started in Turkey where Cecil is from. So, you know, you can see a lot of, um, overlap in, in you know, what we're working on, but also uh, differences. And so um, two things that I take out from, from your different pitches is um, that on the one hand, stories about cycling and, and the relationship of people on bikes with, with cars, um, either um, bikes replacing cars or bikes versus cars, uh, things around safety. And on the other hand, I hear a lot about diversity and you know, different contexts, different needs, different people, different cycles. So it's interesting um, to see how we can kind of deal with both of these um, ideas and, and also how, you know, where our different perspectives meet. And for example, one thing that I was wondering, and, and maybe Florence can, can tell us a little bit about this, because if we think about cycling for all seasons, 
Does, uh, for example, your work at the Eurovelo Roots also include something about the winter season for cycling tourism? When the cycling season and the, the season of tourism for cycling is often much broader than the, the tourism season for regular tourism, of course, it has something to do with uh, the countries that you go to. It's mostly that uh, uh, going cycling in countries in the south is global kind of all year round. There is no problem with that. Then, uh, uh, yeah, as was mentioned in the presentation, it's a lot about safe infrastructure uh, for cycling. So um, in places where it's a bit more difficult to cycle, uh, when there might be snow, uh, then if some safe infrastructure, uh, segregated cycle path, a uh, good surface is built, then it makes things much easier. Because even in, in the wind, in the summer, uh, if you have a bad surface for a cycling path, then in case of rain, it might be uh, improper to cycle. So I think, uh, yeah, putting some emphasis in, in the good building of, of infrastructure is also quite essential for that. So uh, that's also what we, we try to do with the uh, uh, evaluation of cycle routes and those kinds of uh, uh, advices uh, to towards um, yeah, people who've been towards. Okay, thank you, thank you. And and then another uh, cross, uh, what do you call it, crossroad that that we could have is like. Anna, who talks about yeah the the future that many people see in in the tech world is bikes replacing cars with kind of the image that that cars have nowadays. And Jocelyn, who works on bike versus cars, does does one of you want to kind of reflect on that or what popped to mind? Uh, yeah, I think maybe I could just clarify that um, when I criticize uh, the idea that bikes should be the new car, um, I do not criticize the very idea of modal shift that we need uh, less driving and more cycling. What I do criticize or what I'm rather calling, I'm calling for awareness for that if we replace uh, driving with cycling, that I think we need to be aware um, uh, that we also want probably want to keep some of the features that make cycling unique instead of basically tailoring, uh, making cycling much look more like driving. We generally need to have mobility that is more uh, social, that is more safe, that is more comfortable, that is more sustainable, rather than basically uh, trans use um, upgrade bicycle to the extent that it just preserves all the comforts and uh, of the car and uh, loses all the wonderful features of cycling. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I, I get it. Jocelyn, what is your uh, take on that? Yeah, what we see in the Netherlands is that uh, everybody thinks, a lot of people think that uh, everybody is cycling all day but in practical, uh, we've seen uh, a very uh, busy cities uh, like Amsterdam and Utrecht and also around uh, Amersfoort. A lot of people uh, uh, take also the, uh, the car on the small distances. And um, it, it's a kind of pattern. And, uh, and therefore, we, we try to challenge them that, and to let them see that also on the short distances, it is very uh, nice and a pleasure to take the bike. And for example, uh, a car driver is thinking, uh, oh, this route is uh, shorter by car than by bike, but sometimes that is not true. <laughs> and uh, we, we develop a lot of uh, new cycling lanes in the Netherlands, uh, but um, yeah, there's still a lot uh, to, to gain um, uh, also in the Netherlands. <laughs> so uh, that, um, yeah, what, what Anna is explaining is true. Uh, and when we when we let them see and show them uh, the the nice uh, things of the bicycle, because I think it's a golden instrument, uh, it helps others to to yeah, to try and, and and enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I found it interesting that for the future of cycling, uh, both uh, Cecil and Melissa chose a picture of a woman on a bicycle that is not um, the standard, um, you know, two wheel um, 
normal frame, normal frame uh, cycle. Um, and um, Cecil, what what made you choose? I, I know you know you chose it for the people who are on it, but what do you think is important if you want to see more of that or allow more of that? Uh, of course, I want to see more of that, but uh, what actually I want to see is I need options. As a citizen of a city, I need options. Uh, in Istanbul, mostly, there, there is one option, it's a car, or there is the second option is the public transportation. But with car, we know it takes so much time, pollution and all these kind of things with the car. With public transportation, it is too crowded and after COVID, we have other problems. So uh, there is C in Istanbul, there are other options. So we need to, uh, we actually, we need these options and not as the uh, mode of transport, but as the vehicles. Maybe sometimes I can take my foldable bicycle, maybe sometimes I can take my uh, tricycle or other things and I, had, I also need option to park them in safer places. And I believe if we give, I mean, uh, not we, but if the officials give these options to people, they will start uh, choosing bicycles or some uh, other mode of transport instead of cars or you know more, more polluting uh, ways. Okay, thank you. And, and you, Melissa, we have a two more minutes. Do you have... What do we need to see more people like that on different types of bikes? Well, I mean, me as a, as a communication specialist, I think we need to bring more visibility to all these different types of bikes as well. Um, I, growing up in Canada and living there for the first uh, 39 years of my life, I only ever really saw uh, two-wheeled bicycles, tricycles for little kids, uh, and then the odd cargo bike as uh, the boom started to take over. And I think if we give more visibility to the various options and the various types of people who use these different machines to get around, uh, then we can show people, uh, like Cecil was saying, more, there are more options for people. And, and if we give them space, I think our cities will be all the better for it. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm sure we could talk about this much longer, but for now, uh, I want to wrap this session up and I would like to say that I think I, what, what I take from this is that you say, let's embrace the strengths that cycling has and use the current possibilities that are out there, but not everybody knows about and we just don't use them enough. Let's just use it, make sure we can use it in traffic and in our daily lives. And then there is a bright future uh, for cycling. Thank you very much. I hand back to the studio. The entire uh, panel for that very insightful discussion. And thank you for sharing with us your expertise and also suggestions on what we can do to make cycling for women better. Thank you. All right, coming up next in our summit right here, we take a look at electric mobility in Lisbon. There are so many factors at play here. Increase EVs, regulate chargers installation, allocate public space. So how to balance it all? Lisbon has the relevant charging infrastructure already in place for over a decade and plans to increase it are ambitious. So how should we guarantee a fast uptake of EVs, a strong charging network and a balanced use of public space? To answer this, we have Pedro Machado, Advisor for Mobility of the City of Lisbon. Pedro? We're trying to get Pedro on screen.
Welcome back. We do apologize for that slight technical glitch. We have Pedro ready for us now. Pedro Machado coming to us live from Lisbon. Pedro. Hi, how are you? How are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, hi. So, uh, first of all, let me thank to Autonomous uh, uh, Conference for the invite, for being able to be here and share what you've been doing in the electrical mobility scene here in Lisbon. Uh, thanks to uh, Niam Wade and Keith Willen in particular. And my name is Pedro. I work as an advisor for the Deputy Mayor of Mobility, Safety, Economy and Innovation in the city of Lisbon. And the, what I was asked to uh, talk about was a little bit uh, what we are doing uh, in terms of electrical mobility here in the in capital city in Portugal, and especially everything that relates with the, the um, position that electrical mobility uh, will have in the future scenarios uh, here in the city. So the first thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, nowadays we have a lot of, you know, uh, very critical issues to, to discuss. Uh, we just came from two very interesting sessions that were uh, posing the topic on equity, on, on security, on gender uh, equality. Uh, there are other, uh, other issues that we're also addressing here in Lisbon and, and you know, the other cities are doing the same, which is you know, uh, uh, guaranteeing universal access to the mobility ecosystem, uh, tackling safety issues, uh, taking concern about you know, affordability, uh, of the of the public um, public system, uh, the the environmental impacts they have, uh, what's you know what's on with the with the resilience of cities, uh, especially now that we have COVID on the, um, in in place. Uh, but still, I think the most important uh, issue we we have to address is still uh, decarbonization. And I was just looking to the to a um, uh, this. Time magazine cover that uh, sees the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres just saying that we are close to lose the race against climate change, and this is just this is the main driver that is putting you know that is that is conducting uh, our strategy here here in the city. Uh, it's not just us. I mean, it's, it's uh, everybody is looking into this. Uh, this, the, the Imperial Commission just released last December, as you know, the Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy. Uh, they highlight 14, um, 14 goals uh, within the document. I, I brought four of them that relate to, uh, that more closely relate to the, the topic we're discussing here today. Uh, and, and they say that by 2030, we're gonna have 30 million zero emission cars and 80,000 zero emission lorries in operation in, in Europe. This is, these are massive numbers that uh, for us to achieve it, we're gonna need the, the industry to play a, a, a central role and we're gonna need the cities and users also to do the same as we need a massive infrastructure for charging all of these vehicles. They also say that by 2050 near all cars will be zero emission. So this is a trend that we, we all know we have to we have to do. And here in Lisbon, um, uh, transport accounts for 43% of, of all green gas houses emissions. So, uh, and we need to reduce it by 90% by 2050. We're, we're doing the best we can to uh, accelerate this scenario. Uh, and the, the third thing that has been said in sustainable smart mobility strategy is that collectible travel should be also carbon neutral. So this means that we're not only looking into private individual cars, we're looking also into all of the vehicles that, uh, come, that uh, are part of the, of the public uh, transport system. Uh, and finally, another very, very key and, and, and very interesting message and uh, the Secretary General for Mobility, uh, Matthew Balding, is always uh, uh, underlying this aspect. Is we're going to need, we're going to have by 2030, 100 climate neutral cities. So this is the, the European Commission just, you know, putting sky high the, the, the level of ambition in in decarbonization. So this is this is the 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 main driver for us here in the city to um, 
to to you to work on on mobility right now and the baseline that we have is not very nice so uh, just before covid strike we had 30 380,000 cars entering the city every day and you have to know that uh, Lisbon is not is not such a big city we are half a million inhabitants it's true that we have we have very uh, severe uh, commuting patterns we doubled the population during the day to 1 million uh, but if you count also the cars of the people who are in the city, we're talking about maybe half a million cars in the, in the city every day. So this as a baseline and, and, and looking into the targets that we are setting ourselves and the commission, then it's going to be really hard to, uh, to get there. So what we've, we've done is we're, we were looking into the, to the model split uh, as a key indicator uh, and comparing ourselves with the other cities that are doing best than us. And the fact is that uh, more or less half of the trips that are done here in the city right now are done by private car. Uh, so we defined uh, a, a strong um, uh, goal for 2030 to reduce this to uh, a third of, of the trips. So to do this, we need, first of all, to rely on public transport system to be the backbone of, uh, of the mobility ecosystem in the city. So we already have a, a, a nice, uh, a good public transport system, but it lacks it lacks uh, flexibility. You know, to, for public transport to compete with private car, you need to. There are a few key things that you need to do. Uh, so what what we're doing is we're working uh, strongly in 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 active mobility, so uh, uh, taking place for people and for cycling. And we invited all the investors that want to come to operate in the city, shared modes and and ride ailing uh, mode as they are uh, if they are sustainable they can be a, a, a good complement to, uh, complement to the public transport system and that's bringing the the um, flexibility that the public transport alone doesn't have to compete with private cars but still uh, what we if you look into this goal which is very ambitious we still have a third of the of the trips that uh, are going to be done by private car and this means we're, we're still going to have hundreds of thousands of cars in the city. Uh, so what we say is, okay, if we're going to have these cars, at least let, let them be electric or, or, or um, uh, carbon neutral. So what we've done uh, was we designed a strategy. We just published it uh, last year. It's called Move Lisboa. It's, uh, it's a document that sets the, the pace to what we're going to do in the next decade to achieve the goals that we that we set ourselves. It's it's available on the on the website. I can then provide it to the organization, uh, and it defines everything that we need to do. Uh, and basically, what we need to do is to, we need to uh, to make a revolution in in, in mobility. That's the, the thing because we are so far away from where we want to uh, and need to be. To, um, that uh, we definitely have to work hard and a lot on uh, on all of these topics. And and it, that is exactly what we're doing. Do what we are uh, uh, now doing. We're doing a revolution here in the city in public transport, along with the uh, with the central government, all the partners in the city. We we have uh, we have uh, created uh, we have municipalized the bus company, which is the the one that runs on public space, which is the the infrastructure that we manage, and we're putting a lot of money and and investment and energy on renewal. All of the fleet we're having, uh, we're going for electrical buses as much as as much as we can. We're putting uh, a, a better tram um, system. Uh, in in the city, we're we're, we're getting electrical electric boats. Uh, we we just created uh, when I say we, it's you know the 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 city and the other cities around in the metropolitan area and the government itself. We created the Lisbon Metropolitan Transport Company uh, to to manage all of these um, of these issues. We created a, a monthly ticket uh for all public transport that costs 30 euros that's one euro per day uh that's this was a massive reduction in the in the expenses of the of users that's a lot of you know free rides for kids and and serious discounts for seniors we have a lot we have an investment also co-financed by the commission to move on to a to um uh, uh a mobile our mobile ticket to a mobile ticketing system and they're putting a lot of investment 
uh, you know, in go government trials uh, in infrastructure and rail. Uh, at the same time, we are uh, doing also a revolution in public space. This means that we have uh, set up a series of programs in the city that are taking space from cars, from cars situating and parking and giving it back to people to walk and cycling and cycle and create you know, uh, uh, green spaces. And the fact is that we've seen a, a very high um, increase in walkability in the city. We have come, we are now on a third of the trips are done by walking, which is really very different than, than what we had today. At the same time, Lisbon is not a cycling city. For those who know we've been in the city, uh, you know that you know it was very difficult to see a bicycle going around a few years now, but we are growing now at, uh, uh, we've, we've grown 400% in the last four years. We're putting in place a very strong uh, cycling infrastructure and working with a lot of other tools in order to, pr to promote cycling. And at the same time, uh, we have assumed that, you know, all of these mobility services that are now available through technology and especially through the, the smartphone, uh, should be also a, a, a tool to, uh, to be used in, in our strategy. So what we've done is we created our own uh, uh, station-based uh, cycling, um, cycling service uh, that is, has been having a, a massive success. We have uh, around six to seven trips per bicycle per day in, in the system. Uh, but we also had, you know, car sharing, moped sharing, uh, other bike sharing companies and scooter sharing companies coming to the city. One of the things that we impose or, or, or press them to do is to have only electrical, electrical vehicles or active uh, um, or human powered vehicles. Uh, right now with COVID, the situation has changed a lot. So that there are several companies had to close the, the services, but we're seeing a ramp up again. So we have already uh, two, ser two sharing services uh, opening after COVID strike, and we're getting contacts from uh, a lot of different other companies that come to us and say they want to operate in the city. Uh, and finally, we need this revolution also in, in electrical mobility. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, take you through the, you know, a little bit of the story of the electrical mobility here in Portugal, and especially because it's every time I talk about this, people seem to be very interested because our case is a little, is a little bit different from others. We were early adopters of the of this of this uh, solution uh, nationwide. Uh, and our system is a bit is 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 integrated and inter interoperable, which means so. What happened is in two thousand nine, the the Portuguese government created this electrical mobility program, and the base for this was to say we're going to create a system that will integrate everything that has to do with the electrical mobility, uh, publicly accessible. Uh, and we're going to create a platform that will manage everything and everything will have to be integrated into this platform. So this is a, a very different approach from, uh, from other countries. Uh, and what we have done uh, by that time was to define that we're going to go up for a program with a, a pilot program, the first phase, with 1,350 plugs throughout the 25 cities in the country. So in 2010, there was a, the legal framework for this program was defined uh, and it defined, you know, the, the uh, responsibilities of operators. Uh, so charger operators, energy service providers, who is going to do the licensing for the installation and operation of these chargers? What is the, 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 the role of the cities? What is the role of the users? Uh, and so we uh, were, uh, went on this <coughs> trip along with the other cities and, and the government. And in 2012, we, we have uh, published our mobility a municipal plan, electrical mobility municipal, uh, municipal plan. And by the time we have, uh, we had in place 500 publicly accessible slow plugs. And it was also defined that we were gonna give free parking to all electrical vehicles that would use this, um, <clears throat> that, that uh, were using on street parking in the city, not only for charging, but anywhere. Uh, EVs are still actually are still uh, not paying for, for parking in the city. And we, we will maintain this, pol this policy 
while the the market of EVs is not you know strong enough. Uh, by the time the, the everybody that would buy an electrical vehicle would also have access to free electricity. So whoever bought a, a, a vehicle ten years ago went through you know eight or nine years with free parking, free electricity. It was really um, uh, uh, so all, all of those people had, you know, financially uh, excellent incentives to uh, to rent their, car, their cars. Uh, in 2015, there was the government created this entity called Mobi E. Uh, they are the management entity that managed the the entire national scheme. Uh, uh, but in in 2017, the market was still closed, so the electricity was still free. So private investors could not invest. Uh, in charges because they could, they, there was not a business model to run. They could not sell the the, um, the access to uh, the access and or the electricity uh, to uh, to the final users. Uh, and so we said we we couldn't wait anymore, and we decided to invest and start to do our own planning. So in 2000, we created a, a team that was working on this, uh, and we worked. In, indoors to see how we're gonna, you know, boost the the charging infrastructure in the city, and at the same time we were working with the national government to upgrade <coughs> the um, the the already existing uh, charging infrastructure. We created 122 kilowatt uh, plugs. Uh, then in 2019 we made it formal, so we have a mobility and parking company in the city called ML. And we registered ML as an operator. So by uh, starting in March 2019, ML was able to legally uh, install and operate charging stations. So we were taking the risk ourselves. Uh, and in the end of 2019 uh, and through 2019, private operators, you know, seeing the the the, uh, the movement uh, from the government and the local cities. They started to prepare for for the market for the market opening, and they start asking for licenses to install chargers in public space. By 2020, uh, the government uh, opened the market, uh, and it consists all the, the the pilot network uh, in a, in an international con uh, um, uh, con uh, the contest. And uh, four companies run, and they are now running this uh, this large infrastructure. And uh, and we still uh, continue to uh, to do our work. So right now we have we have prepared uh, a, a regulation that defines the rules through which uh, private operators and public operators who can we are registered uh, can apply for licenses to install and operate uh, chargers in the city. So this regulation has been uh, voted in city chamber. It was approved to go into public consultation. This public consultation took place last July and the results, uh, and we are now, the team is now analyzing the, um, the comments that got, we got from the public consultation. We are revising the document and we expect by the end of this year to have the new, version and definitive version of the regulation to be published. And by that time, everything will be clear on how anyone can that is registered can uh, appear, um, apply for a license for installing and operating uh, uh, chargers. And in the meantime, uh, our mobility company was doing, was doing uh, its work and it installed three fast charging hubs in the city, each one of these Fast charging hubs allows for the uh, par for the cons um, uh, for the the charging of 12 to 15 vehicles at the same time with 50 kilowatts uh, power. So just to give you a, a glimpse of uh, where we stand right now in terms of the electrical mobility, although uh, our programs and our uh, our um, uh, the electrical mobility program is already 10 years old, uh, we have uh, roughly 10,000 electrical vehicles in the city. So Alpha, Alphavit is uh, uh, battery, uh, uh, battery electrical vehicles and Alphavit is, is plug-in. 
so a number that we that is now started to increase a lot, but it took a lot it took a while to uh, to start growing. Uh, but we, when we look at, at the sales, when you we have last in 2020, we uh, the, uh, we had 2,004 electrical vehicles sold in Portugal, which is a great number. Uh, it, it is an, an increase in 13% for BEVs and an increase of 105% for plug-ins. While at the same time, uh, internal combustion engine uh, vehicles had a decline in sales of 41%. So the trend is looking good. Uh, at the same time, right now in our infrastructure in the city, we have uh, 645 charging plugs, normal charging plugs. That means uh, up to 22 kilowatts per plug. And we have already 136 fast charging plugs. I'm just talking about uh, you know, equipment that are in public accessible space. Uh, from these ones, um, uh, our own mo mo mobility company has 39 fast charging and is in, as in, and is in, in um, now installing 120 normal plugs on street and 260 normal plugs on their own parks. Uh, and the requests from private operators are rising fast. Uh, it's good, it's important to know, it's a different situation from other cities, but in Lisbon, only 25% of households have a garage, which means that people that want, if you want people to change from, you know, regular cars to electrical cars, we need to provide a very significant uh, public, uh, public uh, space uh, infrastructure, because they don't have where to charge their own cars at home. So we set up a goal of having 10,000 plugs by 2030. That's what we're, we're working on. Uh, and the, one of the things that uh, I've been asked to, to discuss was uh, how to balance the, the promotion of electrical vehicles with public space use. And the, one of the things that we, we need to do is to now, uh, is to uh, assume that in our market, we, uh, uh, price is not regulated. So we have a free market. On the images here, you can see, for instance, uh, from our mobile company, a fast charging and, uh, can, can charge you 15 cents per minute to charge in a 50 kilowatt uh, charger. While at the same time, next to it, you can have a slow charger, which is charging 0.4, cents per minute uh, so prices vary a lot uh, which means that uh, this is gonna you know the, this is gonna evolve in a way that we don't really know uh, and this matching of the, of the offer of, of infrastructure and the demand for the infrastructure is going to be difficult from one side we are we're doing our best to to install infrastructure in order to to promote the uptake of electrical vehicles but if we put a lot of infrastructure and, and the, the electrical vehicles don't come, then there is no business. So it's, it's a, difficult, a difficult match that we are, we're looking at. What we're doing, what we're doing so it's to look into the, uh, the indicator the European Commission uh, defines. It's a rough indicator that says that we should have roughly in public space one charger per every 10 electrical vehicles. So it's more or less where we stand right now. And we will be looking into this indicator as we go along. So now we are doing this licensing, uh, you know, to boost this infrastructure, but we also have to take care of, uh, of the use of the public space. So what we are doing now is working with three, three internal teams. One is looking into the, the mobility strategy. So where should we install the chargers in a city scale, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a city scale uh, perspective. So where should we put the, the slow chargers? Where should we put the, the fast chargers? Uh, we have an, another team, which is a public space team that is looking more locally uh, in, a, in a smaller scale, how these chargers can be installed uh, in in a, in, a, in a road or in a in a street scale, so should they be on a sidewalk? Are they, are they taking space from pedestrians? Should we put it on on pavement? Is it dangerous? How can we do it? And we have another team looking into the underground constraints. So every time that you want to install a, a charger, you have to see if there are pipes or cables or whatever underground that we don't see it. So we have to have this team also on board. 
so in this regulation that we launched uh, for public consultation, we have defined a series of criteria. I'm just highlighting here a few. So one of the criteria, this is, this is on debate uh, still because we are now going, moving on to having meetings with the, the operators, with the operators to see how this will affect their own, uh, their own services. Uh, so one of the rules that we have defined is that we're going to limit the number of chargers to 20% of the parking places that we have per street. That means if one street has 100 parking uh, places right now for you know regular cars, 20% of these of these parking places can be converted into into charging places. Another thing is that we have divided the the city into four, 24 zones uh, parishes, and we have uh, defined a limit. Uh, for the number of chargers that each operator can can install in each one of these zones, uh, the reason for this is that we want we want to uh, spread the investment through uh, through the, the uh, different operators. So we don't want to have one operator to have um, uh, a, a, a significant part of the of the market. Uh, another thing that we are doing is that we are obliging the operator to invest first in the, the residential areas and the surrounding areas of the city and less in the central areas. So if you are an investor, if you are an operator and you want to in, install a charger in, you know, in the main avenues of, the, of Lisbon, uh, then you have to prove that you are interested in, in, in investing seriously in the city. So we, we are obliging you to invest first in the outskirts and then if you prove and you invest there, then we are, we, you will get credits that will allow you to invest in the central areas as well. Uh, so uh, all, another rule is that if you want to do fast chargers, you will also have to do slow chargers uh, because we know there are different you know, uh, business scenarios in, in each one of them, but we will need both types. Uh, we only allowing, we're only allowing fast chargers close to major roads and avenues. So we don't want fast chargers to go, you know, severe, high uh, uh, above 100 kilowatt chargers to go into the core of the of the neighborhoods. We are giving licenses for five years, but they can be extended for another five years. Uh, we have taxes to apply. I mean, these these operators are going to use uh, they are going to use public space, uh, and this public space belongs to all of us. So if they are taking profit out of this public space, they should share a little bit. And these taxes are higher in the city center and lower in the, in the, out, in the outskirts. Uh, we also put the aggressive um, uh, SLAs for, uh, for chargers that are not operating. So if, if an operator has a charger that is just you know, taking space, but it's not providing service, then we will take the license out of it. Uh, so just one, two last slides. I want to say that we're not only looking at, uh, at the chargers for private, uh, you know, light duty vehicles. We're looking into, into electrical mobility from the bus, uh, in buses, in trucks. So we see a, a series of trucks that uh, the city bought for, uh, for its services. You see the uh, buses from, the bu from our bus company. You see electrical bicycles from... Uh, from the, the the shared companies, and you see, and we also have, you know, we're we're now creating, for instance, programs to help people buy electrical electrical bicycles. We have a programs for for cargo electrical cargo bikes as well. And my last words would would go to uh, to corporations. The thing that I want to stress is that we have made serious compromises regarding decarbonization. The government have done it, the, the cities have done it. We are working hard on that, but we will not achieve it if we don't play it all the same game. And corporations in particular, they have to look into their own uh, um, companies and, and, and make them and make a change in, in, in mobility. So we had uh, challenged all the, 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 the companies in, in, in Lisbon the major companies in Lisbon to uh, to sign a pact with us. We call it the Corporate Mobility Pact, and uh, we had a very very strong response from the from the corporations in the city that say we want to be part of it. We want to do what we will do our share. Our workers, our our clients will come in more sustainable ways to uh, to our premises. 
Uh, and so the, this is a program, a pack that, uh, that is now going to the end of the second year. We have the results from the, the monitoring of the, the actions that they're putting in the first year. And we see that there was an increase from the companies. Uh, the number of chargers that uh, they have in, in their own premises increased by 50%. And we can see that uh, an increase by the users, by the, you know, the, the, the employees and the, and the clients uh that that go through these companies they they increase by 81 percent so this was a little bit the story of uh, what we are doing in in electrical mobility in lisbon and how we can you know boost the 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 scene uh but, but still maintain a, 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 an interesting balance between the, the the increase of the infrastructure and the use of public space thank you so much Um, very interesting presentation. I just wanted to dive deeper into uh, what you just shared, you know, because you work for the city of Lisbon advising on mobility. So you will be the best person to know and ask this question. Who really or what are the main drivers of innovation in terms of electrical mobility in your city? Uh, well, well, thank you so much for the, for the question. Very interesting question. Uh, I would say that the, 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 main, the main drivers, I would say, first of all, uh, the governments, so the city itself, uh, but also the, also the national governments, because we set, we are the ones who manage mobility, we are the ones that set the vision, we are the ones that define the strategy, we create regulations, we create in incentives. Uh, so we create the rules for, for, the, for the mobility scene. But also, there's a, uh, 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 the, the technological providers are also very important drivers because they bring uh, new technology every day. You see, you know, new solutions, new mobility solutions coming to the market, and we have to adapt and see how we can incorporate these new solutions into our uh, mobility ecosystem and take profit uh, of it and exclude the ones that don't. Uh, that don't uh, are that are not aligned with our strategy and take profit from the, the ones. And finally, I would say that there is a third driver which is very important, which is the the resident and the the city user, uh, because uh, they are the ones that choose which are the winning mobility solutions in the end of the day. They are the ones who choose if they want to go by public transport, if they want to ride a scooter, if they want to you know go in a ride hailing and uh, Sometimes you, you provide solutions that look to be, you know, very, very interesting. They are going to take a significant part of the, of the market. And then for some reason, people don't just, they just don't use it. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes, you know, there are some inventions that seem to be no, not so interesting. And in the end, people just love it. So there are a few drivers that can, you know, that, that maintain this, this thing alive and dynamic. Yeah, that is true. Well, thank you for that, Pedro. Um, last, last word before we close your session. Can you tell us the importance of electrical mobility in a city like Lisbon? There's all this push, but what is really the importance of it? Well, uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's, it's going to play, it's playing already a critical role. Yeah? So as I told you, we, our strategy is based on the public transport infrastructure coupled with active mobility, with shared services, with mass uh, uh, solutions, et cetera, to, cr to create more flexibility and, uh, and to, uh, to allow us to have a very multimodal uh, transport system in the city, something that you know, everybody that wakes up in the morning and says, looking at my agenda, definitely I have a series of different options. Today, I'm gonna go with this, or I'm gonna go by train because then I can, take the bicycle to, to a shared bicycle to go to the meeting and then I can take a you know a ride hailing to go to the gym uh, and so to have a multimodal uh, um, um, ecosystem is, is the, the thing but we need you know all the vehicles even this multimodal ecosystem is based on vehicles so we need all of these vehicles to be decarbonized and electrical electrical mobility it, it plays the, this role and so we need these vehicles to evolve towards uh, being electric or another alternative uh, decarbonized uh, uh, solution. And still, we will have 33%, if we achieve our goal, we're gonna have it by 2030, 33% of trips done by private car 
and these need to be also electric. It's a massive uh, ambition, but we have to do it. There is no, no plan B. Well, thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you so much for spending time with us here at the International Mobility Summit. All right. Many of you in the mobility community know that there are increasingly challenging decarbonization targets set for the 2030s and beyond, which means that the next generation of leaders will inherit a difficult transportation landscape. So what are the challenges weighing on these young people entering the mobility workforce or positions of responsibility within their organizations? How prepared are they for some of the biggest challenges of the 21st century? This discussion coming up next will explore the growing role of young people for leading mobility decarbonization. And it will be led by Alex Pazuchanix. He is the Regional Director of YPT Western Europe, and he's also the Head of Policy of Via Nova. So if Alex is ready for us, I'm ready to hand it over to you, Alex. Hi there. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is uh, Alex Pezukanix. I am uh, the new uh, regional director for the, the Western Europe region of the Young Professionals in Transportation, uh, as well as uh, the head of policy uh, for Vianova, a French uh, tech startup focusing on mobility data. Uh, I'm joined today by an uh, illustrious uh, transatlantic panel uh, of peers uh, in the Young Professionals in Transportation Network uh, to talk a little bit about um, both the process of being uh, a young professional in transportation uh, and especially uh, about wrestling with some of the challenges uh, that have been discussed uh, in this conference over uh, the uh, over today and, and tomorrow as well. Um, what is uh, the, uh, the young professional experience in dealing with some of the major transportation challenges, uh, especially decarbonization uh, and uh, electrification and the move to a cleaner, more sustainable transport uh, environment? Um, so I'd like to begin by uh, asking uh, my fellow panelists to, uh, to introduce themselves, um, to talk a little bit about kind of your journey to, uh, to transportation uh, or, or transport, uh, depending on uh, where you are and how you pronounce it, um, and uh, per perhaps uh, what you think uh, kind of drives you uh, to be in the transportation space uh, and also drives your peers uh, and your colleagues uh, kind of in the young professional uh, demographic. Uh, so why don't I start with uh, with my peer uh, in the, the Young Professionals Network uh, for Northern Europe, uh, Katie uh, Thompson. Sure, thanks, Alex. So uh, yeah, I've been working with Alex, um, his counterpart, the regional director for the Northern Europe YPT chapter that we're, or region that we're just starting out. Um, in my day job, I work as a product manager at Masabi, which is a fare payments as a service software and hardware company. Um, and I'm based in London. Um, but if you go back 10 years, I think this would have been a total surprise to me. I studied life sciences at university, so I really accidentally fell into the transit industry um, through a customer service job that I got after university. But I think that if I had known more about the industry, I would have like sought it out sooner. I was always interested in the problems of transport. Um, and as soon as I found myself in the transport industry, it's like I know that it's where I want to stay. I'm really fascinated by the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and I love that the work that I do can impact the, the lives of people really tangibly. And I know also that the problems of transportation, they're not going away, no matter how much we make virtual conferences happen, like you're always still gonna need to get people from one place to another and get things from one place to another. So it means that there's always gonna be new and different problems to solve. So uh, that's really exciting. Um, and that's, yeah, what motivates me to stay in the industry. I feel like that's pretty similar. It's a, I get that feeling from peers as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, next, uh, we've got David uh, from uh, the Young Professionals in Transportation uh, Mid-Atlantic region uh, in the US. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Clark. I'm an independent consultant based in the Washington DC area. And before that, I was in New York City government for about a decade. Um, I wound up in transportation a little bit by accident. This is my third career. Um, I've been in entertainment, I've been in academia, and basically to make a long story short, when I came out of grad school, I was looking for some place where I could really make a, a tangible difference and really the best place for innovation. And I went and I interviewed with a lot of city agencies and they all gave me some variety of the story that, well, we basically do what the mayor and the policy people tell us what to do. And I, I talked to some of the transportation people and they said, well, 
nobody really knows about this area that much. Um, we, we, we make it up. And I said, oh, that's for me. Um, and I went and I, I work. So I specialize mainly in on-demand and private sector transportation. Um, which is a little different than what people do. And just to, just to clarify for our, our European viewers, um, Mid-Atlantic does not mean Iceland. Um, <laughs> so it's the Mid-Atlantic region of the US, which covers New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, and Baltimore. Um, so it's really the heart of the transit world in the United States. Um, so it's a very interesting place to kind of reach out to people and, and think about what kind of projects we can do. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, from uh, YPT Montreal, um, we're joined by Per Skivy. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so I'm Per Skivy Muir. I am the head of communications here in, at uh, YPT Montreal. Uh, I also work as a mobility solutions project manager at Blaze, which is a startup based in Montreal that develops solutions for uh, public mobility to make them more efficient based on AI. Um, uh, I had a background in civil engineering, and when I finished my bachelor, I knew that I didn't want to stay in the building and structure industry, and I explored all my, all my options, and transportation was by far the one that I liked the most, and I really don't regret it, and as Katie said earlier, uh, what's more interesting for me in this field, and I think a lot of people share it, and this is a proof that Katie just mentioned the same points, is the direct impact that my job have on people's lives. Any small decision uh, could impact a group of people, no matter the size, but it's kind of a responsibility and a challenge at the same time to try to make people's lives better because everyone needs to move from point A to point B, and not just everyone, but everything. So that's mainly what drives me in this field. Great, thank you. Um, so I think you know there are obviously a, a couple of uh, distinguishing features in the way um, I think that different generations uh, are approaching the, the transportation challenge. Uh, there's been obviously an increasing focus over the, the last few uh, decades, and, and in particular, I would say accelerated um, in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, around a focus on uh, kind of uh, a more sustainable, more equitable uh, transportation system that uh, sort of breaks out of the uh, the automobile dominated uh, paradigm that we've we've existed with uh, for for quite a long time, uh, and also uh, sort of the the sort of top down uh, direction of uh, of transportation planning and, and engineering. Uh, so I wonder uh, if if uh, you guys maybe starting with Katie. Um, sort of what is the, um, uh, what, what do you see as the sort of focus on um, how to engage uh, underrepresented communities, uh, sort of new voices in uh, transportation planning uh, and design um, to make sure that, uh, that, that young professionals are coming sort of specifically with a focus around um, uh, inclusion and uh, different approaches to, to outreach and engagement? I think there's two there's two parts to that question. One of them is how do we reach the people that are going to be affected by the services, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one is how do we engage different kinds of people to participate in transport um, and like yes. join the industry. Um, on the first one, just quickly, I think that there's so many new technologies to reach people, and like there's an understandable enthusiasm for using digital technology to reach people for consultations. But we need to not forget about those people who are going to be overlooked. Um, more interestingly, I think, about engaging people in the transport industry, the reason I never thought about it was that I didn't know that there were so many different kinds of jobs in transport. And I think, I think about sometimes you see those ads for the, the army or the military and they advertise all of the different jobs you can do in the army. You could like be an air traffic controller, you can work in HR, you can do like management or all of these other much more interesting things in those examples. Um, I think that the transport should go in that vein and like just advertise all the different problems you could be solving, the ways that you can impact people's lives. Uh, if I'd known, or if someone had done an outreach at my university, maybe I would have thought about this as a career path sooner. Um, and then maybe, yeah, different types of people. If you did outreach at universities, at high schools, we're going to be solving these same kinds of problems for years and years to come. But like you said, we need different kinds of people to be involved in solving those problems so that we know we're solving them for all kinds of people. Um, I think one of the other uh, sort of trends uh, over the last few years has been an increasing 
uh, let's say, collaborative environment between uh, the, the public and private sectors. Um, I, I think in, in the past, there's been sort of a, a firmer line um, uh, dividing those, these two sides of the industry uh, apart from one another and, and often kind of creating uh, antagonism um, between the, the public and the private sector. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Paraskevi, if, if you could talk a little bit about um, kind of how you think the relationship uh, between people working uh, on public and private sector sides of transport uh, is changing uh, with the advent of of young professionals kind of entering the workforce uh, to, to a large degree. Yeah, well, actually, I have personally worked in the public and the private sector here in Montreal, and I feel like public-private partnership is the way forward. Um, I also feel like young professionals usually are more fluid and are more focused on the outcome of a project uh, rather than on the stakeholders involved. Whereas more experienced people in the field, especially those who have worked, who have spent most of their career in one uh, of both sectors, they tend to get too comfortable in the structure for exploring new possibilities. So I feel like this is the main difference between young professionals and more experienced professionals in the field. That's great. Um, I, I think a, a related uh, element uh, here, David, I, I used to joke about um, you know, being on the public sector side uh, can sometimes require being a, being a happiness camel, right? Uh, sort of savoring uh, progress on a uh, on a project um, because you recognize that there are often pitfalls, uh, often uh, delays to to delivering. Um, you know, in in your experience, uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of what what you see that uh, that causes projects to uh, to get by the wayside, particularly you know projects that. Uh, that young professionals are really excited and enthusiastic uh, and kind of emotionally invested in. Um, you know, why do those projects go sideways? Um, and how uh, do, you, uh, do you see uh, sort of successful examples of um, either not being discouraged and not kind of losing that momentum uh, or two, uh, kind of avoiding the, uh, the, the fall in the first place? Yeah, this is kind of my sweet spot um, because when I worked in government, I worked as a regulator of private industry. So we weren't responsible for delivering the service ourselves, but we'd create the structure within regulation of how it would work. And I often say regulation is another kind of technology. It shapes what you're going to get. Um, I would say, honestly, the number one reason I see projects go bad in this sector is lack of understanding of what the projects actually are. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of really dogmatic thought, especially in kind of the larger engineering firms. So there's this kind of idea, and I, this really, I want to echo what Katie said before, where people don't really have a wide awareness of what the diverse range of jobs are, what the diverse range of perspectives are, because they're kind of funneled from a school program into a large firm, they climb that ladder, and then, and then what? Um, but there's a lot of things happening at the ground level. And I would say, when I say understanding, I mean really understanding the actual intersection of the stakeholder point of views. It's very difficult to convince someone to do something if you don't understand what their point of view is. And at the same time, there's a lot you can do kind of internally within these large structures, right? So whether you're private sector or public sector, you have budgets, you have rules. Um, you have stakeholders. Um, one acronym that we use a lot in the States is HIPPO, um, highest paid person's opinion. So, you know, kind of managing up is, is really important in this, but not just, you know, kind of your boss or your boss's boss, but also all the other people who participate. And, and I was fortunate enough to run one of the largest public-private partnerships in New York City history. where We partnered with a car company to actually custom design a vehicle for the city's taxi cab use. And no one had ever done it before. And basically it was me and a crew of young people. Um, and I just told them every day, you know, I said, okay, we're just gonna keep going. It doesn't matter what the obstacles are. It doesn't matter what the naysayers say until the mayor taps me on the shoulder and says, stop, I'm just gonna keep going. And that's what it took. And I think that's been a missing element in a lot of projects. This idea that if it's not done perfectly, it's a failure. It doesn't show up on time, it's a failure. And really it's the just keep going mentality that, that drives success because these are things that interface with the real world. Um, there's often a software element, but a lot of times it's just real physical reality facing you. And you just have to, just have to persevere. And I think the assumptions are, if it doesn't happen in exactly this way, it's wrong. And that's not 
really the goal oriented way that you need to focus on these things. Do you think, uh, Ed, this is maybe a question to, to everyone, but uh, maybe Patrick if you want to start, I, I think, you know, to, to your point, David, the, the, the sort of uh, success is, is measured by progress, um, right? Not necessarily completion. Uh, however, uh, we've got a lot of uh, cities and, and national governments, uh, you know, setting very explicit targets uh, around uh, decarbonization goals, uh, climate reduction uh, goals, mode shift targets um, that that frankly are are sort of becoming increasingly challenging to uh, to deliver um, as we as we get closer to 2030 to 20, 2050. Um, you know, what, what way do you think that these, these sort of crises and, and challenges um, uh, sort of make you, uh, how do they make you feel about your work? Uh, are, are you, are your, your peers, like, are, are you nervous? Um, are you uh, sort of enthusiastic about the challenge? Um, what, what is kind of a, a coping me mechanism uh, that, that you've developed uh, around dealing with uh, some of these very large, you know, almost intractable problems uh, while recognizing kind of of the progress that you can make uh, in your, uh, you know, in your domain. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Well, actually, with transportation being like the second most polluting industry in the world, I feel like I have a big responsibility, even without setting limits. But we got to a point where it's very dramatic. And this responsibility does make me a little bit nervous, I admit, because um, this responsibility pushes me to first try to limit the impact that transportation uh, has on the environment, but also to raise awareness about how much transportation can be polluting. But on the other hand, I also feel satisfied because I consider myself an active part of the solution. I am trying as much as I can, especially with my work now, to try to promote more efficient transit options and try to develop in some way a more sustainable mobility on the long run. So I would say it's a mix of both but uh, there is definitely hope and I feel like I'm part of it. So it's already satisfying. Can I add uh, to that, Alex? Yes, please. I was just gonna say, I, I agree with you, Paskivi. I think something that makes me excited and encouraged is the fact that I don't have to think about how I fit into the problems of decarbonization so much because I am already part of the solution because I'm already working in this field. I think we're really lucky in that respect. Um, one thing I worry or I wonder about is there will be a lot of pressure on the industry to change. Um, I hope that that pressure does not make us forget the customers and the passengers that we're serving. Because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that we're offering something that works for people. Um, and hopefully, I, I could see a, a risk where uh, that pressure to change and the desire to adopt new technology or adopt new ways of working forgets about the people and things that are using the service. You know, I think that that's a really useful point. Um, what about uh, sort of as as you were thinking about that evolution, um, Katie? Like this, uh, when when uh, uh, transportation was kind of only the planners and the engineers and the uh, the kind of uh, the construction crews um, doing doing the work. Uh, you know, in in Pittsburgh, where where I used to work. Uh, we didn't have a department of transportation. Uh, it was it was just public works, uh, and it was just sort of the construction and the focus on the infrastructure. Um, now you're seeing uh, a lot of people with a lot of various uh, job titles and backgrounds kind of entering into the the transport space. Um, I think, you know, in particular, kind of this uh, this numtot generation, right? Like the uh, the the folks that have kind of gotten engaged um, uh, in transport through technology, through uh, kind of um, uh, an interest in uh, city life and city living. Um, what do you uh, what do you think kind of the the, the typical uh, job profile uh, of somebody in transportation is going to look like uh, in the future? Um, and you know how how do you sync up uh, this sort of more traditional, more staid focus on infrastructure and, and engineering um, when at the same time you have this uh, infusion of uh, interest and experience in technology? Uh, and sort of other forms of uh, transport adjacent uh, industries? That's a pretty astute question. I like the word infusion. Um, I do think a lot of people, a lot more people are gonna kind of fall into transport because they're interested in the technology. And, and that's gonna happen, really that's gonna probably happen to every industry as, as tech takes over the world. Um, 
I think the transport industry should really like be conscious of this and open the door to those people and make sure that they get the opportunity to learn about the tangible impacts of their work. Um, and the people who, who don't necessarily have a transport background, but they're software engineers working on transport projects, it's the responsibility of people supporting those projects and the stakeholders to make sure that the impact is clear. Um, similarly, on the flip side, I think that people can often be attracted by the flashiness of tech. And so maybe there's a case to be made that traditional fields need to kind of up their game in the way that they're advertising what the job looks like. Um, David, you kind of alluded to this, that the job could be made more dynamic so that it matches a bit more like the work experience of, of a traditional tech company. Um, something I think that the, the MBTA in Boston does this, has made attempts to do this. They've built a customer experience unit in their organization that functions kind of more like a tech company and has traditional tech company roles like product managers. That could be an interesting model for more of the traditional uh, organizations to look into. Great. Um, David, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, engagement in the decision making process. So you you mentioned kind of the example in New York. Um, what are some other ways, uh, you know, without uh, uh, without becoming cliche, right, uh, and uh, needing needing to learn uh, texting acronyms or whatever? Uh, what is the uh, what's the appropriate way um, to really make sure that um, uh, young people are engaged in uh, the decision making process of uh, you know, major projects, particularly in organizations like government, um, which tend to be very hierarchical, um, you know, very uh, sort of oriented around uh, experience uh, and uh, qualification. Um, what are uh, sort of some new approaches to management or organization um, that you think could really help um, uh, get young professional voices sort of more integrated at, at different stages of the process? Well, I, I can't stress enough teams and coalitions. And I think I'm interested in this solution because it works both in a very flat hierarchy and a very structured hierarchy. Um, so often in my, in my own career, um, I've been kind of a side addition to a project or a side addition to a firm where the firm won't necessarily hire me directly, but I'll come in as a contractor or I'll come in as an advisor. Um, and that's something that you can do with the younger or newer folks within any organization is they tend to be very eager. They want to learn. They need to learn. It's not about learning mutual buzzwords. It's not about the jargon because that changes over time. And if you're always chasing the latest, greatest thing, you never really get anywhere because the, the target always moves and it's hard to make a long term plan. But I think even if you work within a very structured organization, um, you know, if you have interns or new people or an orientation program, give them something to do that you don't necessarily have time to do and see what they come up with. Um, you know, I, I've often said to people, you know, you're not an intern, you're either on my team or you're not on my team. And I think that's a mentality that needs to spread, that if they're on your team, give them something to do. And engagement is where you're going to reach people. And you can break any task, you can break any project into smaller pieces and you're going to get the perspectives. You're, you're already hired them. You're already paying them. Um, just giving them grunt work to do is not efficient. It really isn't. That's not to say that, hey, you, you just got out of university. We're going we're gonna to put you in charge of the billion dollar project. Um, although sometimes that works out. It depends on what the billion dollar project is. But I think thinking of kind of the universe of transportation as groups that form and divide and come together for specific things and then go on to other things rather as these kind of large monoliths is where most of your innovation successes are gonna come. And, and in order to do that, you can't divide people into young, old, experienced, retired. It's just, do you have the knowledge and perspective we need on this particular task or not? And if you don't, how do you go and get it? Um, so with uh, with our remaining time together, one one question for the whole group. Um, you know, we we talked about uh, what what makes you nervous or uh, kind of what keeps you keeps you up at night. Uh, let's let's think about the opposite, right? Um, what what are you excited about uh, as as young professionals uh, in transportation? Um, you know, what are the ways that you uh, you build community? What keeps you motivated uh, and your your sort of peers? 
um, you know, engaged um, uh, and, you know, potentially uh, uh, what are some of the, the programming and the, the resources that you've seen uh, kind of as, uh, as a member of Young Professionals in Transportation uh, to really uh, kind of encourage uh, that, that community building? Uh, maybe start uh, Periscopy. Yeah, sure. I feel like, um, especially me being part of YPT and seeing how people are really involved and motivated to make transit and transportation in general more sustainable, more efficient, the hope they have for the industry and the dreams, the big dreams they have. Uh, well, it gives me a lot of hope. And plus, I feel like it's a small community still because we don't have this we kind of have a lack of visibility on what we do and we're still like a small community that stick together um, even on the international level and this is very interesting to me because I get to explore different approaches with different young people who have um, this spark about making life and making transportation better and it's always interesting to get in touch with people with a different approach that is as interested as yours but it's just different it keeps um, your horizon open and it keeps you thinking about what if so that's really interesting uh, for me. Katie, David? Yeah, I completely agree with what you said, um, especially about being part of the Young Professionals of Transportation group. Uh, it's a really welcoming group. It was really welcoming to me as someone without an academic background in transport. So I'd like to like make sure that everyone knows that. Um, and it's also been a great way to like, keep an eye on all the interesting projects that are going on around the world, Look, looking at the diversity of exciting ventures that people are doing in different places, like the cycle infrastructure expansion in Montreal, that makes me really hopeful for the future, other like car-free street movements, um, and getting to learn about those through the people who are working on them as part of the YPT network is really exciting and, and makes me excited for the future. The other thing I would say is that something that makes me optimistic is that people are talking about transport and the role of transport in society in a way that they didn't really talk about this five or 10 years ago. Maybe that's my growth in the industry as well, but people um, that I know outside of transport also know about things like scooter pilots. They know about, you know, the discussion around fare free transport. And that's really exciting. I think that the role of transport in society is um, being elevated a bit more. Yeah, I would, I would, I would certainly agree with that. And I would say certainly I've seen, I mean, just looking in the past 10 years makes me a relentless optimist. Um, 10 years ago, a hybrid electric car was a huge deal. You know, a scooter share program was this radical new pilot. Um, these things are very, very commonplace and, and it has progressed beyond that. Um, I would say within the context though of YPT and kind of what we're doing and, and why I was interested in, in working more with the organization was, um, this is slowly changing, but I think there's still too much of a focus in the industry on a handful of superstar cities and kind of mega projects. And certainly in the US context, I am, sick to death of hearing about New York and San Francisco. Um, there are other places on the continent where millions of people live that are doing really interesting things and are able to innovate because they're not these mega cities, because they're not the place that everyone is looking at. Um, you know, I, you know, part of my job is to kind of scout out the private sector for investors. And I always tell them, there's lots of places that nobody is looking at that have the potential to do great, interesting things with decarbonization, with innovative transport modes, um, with just getting people on buses because it's not a place where there's a lot of dogma. It's not a place where they're really locked in. And that's, that's one of the things we're really focusing on in the Mid-Atlantic region is how can we start new chapters in places that have been neglected like this? Um, you know, we're gonna try and start a chapter in the state of West Virginia, which is very rural um, and very below average income for North America. Um, but we want to get people out of single use cars. So how do we do that? And the first step is go to where they are and talk to them and find out what their needs are and come up with new ways to do fixed route transit, on-demand transit. So I'm very, I'm very optimistic about that. And I see a lot of that happening in a way that it didn't five or 10 years ago. Fantastic. Um, well, I would like to uh, thank uh, our panelists. Uh, I um, enjoyed the conversation. 
Um, if uh, you are a uh, young professional in transportation, particularly in Europe, uh, please uh, feel free to, uh, to look us up um, uh, on LinkedIn or uh, to reach out to, uh, to Katie or I um, about getting involved in the new organization. Um, and we, uh, we really appreciate the, the opportunity to, uh, to present today. All right, thank you very much, uh, Alex and co, for that insightful discussion and also for encouraging more young people to step into the sector and change the world, to put it mildly. All right, and now to close day three of the International Mobility Summit. We would like to put cooperative, connected, and automated mobility at the forefront of our discussion. What are the biggest obstacles in trusting connected and mobility solutions? Safety is often addressed in the initiative designed to support EU countries and the automotive industry in their transition to connected and automated driving. Numerous large-scale demonstrations and pilots are taking place, but they are not necessarily addressing the mobility needs of citizens. So beyond raising user awareness, what additional steps are needed to achieve trust? To discuss this, I am joined by Henriette Cornett, Senior Manager at UITP and her esteemed panel of guests. So hi, Henriette and co. Henriette, I believe this panel will be conducting a few polls and Q&A through the Hopin platform. Is that correct, Henriette? Hello, hello everyone and uh, thanks, yeah. Yes, that's correct. Our session will be uh, interactive. So please check out uh, uh, the, the platform and uh, don't hesitate to interact with us through questions, but also, yeah, just ask any question you will have to the speaker and we will come back, come back to it at the end of the session. All right, Henriette, now over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, welcome, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our session, uh, which is called Trust is a Must, how to deploy CCAM in a safe and trusted manner. So CCAM for Connected and Cooperative Automated Mobility. I am your moderator today. So my name is Henriette Cornet. I work at the UITP, which is the Interna International Association of Public Transport, and I'm coordinating activity around CCAM. So today, the focus, Atis has just been said, and as he said, is around trust. So we know somehow that we need it, but why exactly? What do we want to achieve? having trust from the, fire, from the end users for CCAM, and also what have we learned from past projects, uh, what is the vision from the, from the European uh, Commission with funding uh, projects. So we will talk all about this today. We have five speakers. I am one of them, I will be the last one speaking. Uh, and for your information, we will have, so it will be 10 minutes presentation, we vote a direct question afterwards, but don't hesitate to put all your questions in the chat and we will, uh, in the Q&A, and we will go back to it. At the end of the session, we will have some time for discussions. But I don't want to take the floor any longer, and I suggest we move on directly with our first speaker. And, um, oh no, we will have, sorry for that, we will have first a poll. So let's uh, go to the poll. I hope it is, uh, let me check in parallel. If the first question is coming, there should be a question coming in. Okay, I don't see any poll yet, but what I suggest to do is we don't, uh, we don't lose precious time from presentation of that. So I will introduce the next speaker and uh, check from time to time the poll. There should be question coming up and we will be able to answer, to, to go back to your answer uh, later in the discussion. So I suggest we start, uh, we start now. So Tom, Tom Alkim is with us. Is, uh, Tom is policy officer um, for connected and automated driving at the European Commission in the DG research and innovation. Tom will set the scene and uh, uh, tell us more about European, uh, EU, EU ambitions and strategy. 
So Tom, please uh, share your, your screen and uh, welcome. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you, Henriette, for this uh, brief introduction. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be in this uh, session. And I'd like to share with you the, the vision that we have on, uh, on CCAM and uh, uh, that in general, but also specifically on why trust is a must. So as you may know, uh, uh, in December of last year, the Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy was, uh, was published and um, you can find various milestones in there. And the one that's related to CCAM is that by 2030, automated mobility will be deployed at large scale. Now, to get to these uh, milestones, there are 10 uh, key areas for action um, uh, defined. And you, if, if you go into um, the report, I assume that uh, everyone uh, will get the slides afterwards. So you find the URL here in the, in the bottom of the slide. You can go to the document and then you see at flagship six, this is particular for making connected and automated multimodal mobility a reality. And there you see some specific uh, uh, actions. And one of them is also on the, the CCAM partnership, but I'll get back to that later. So why are we doing this? We are, we are not doing this or supporting this because it can be done, uh, but, but we do it because it is an instrument uh, with a lot of potential, if done right. And we think that CCAM can uh, make transport safer, greener, and uh, more accessible. But to do it right, you have to address a lot of challenges, and we, we still have those. So uh, uh, contrary to popular uh, belief, uh, the technology is not completely there. So some key technologies are still being developed. And uh, also we need uh, safety validation methodologies to allow them on the road. So this is, this is the start point. But in the end, you need all these uh, four elements. So you need technology that works to provide you that service. You also need a legal framework to allow it on the streets. You need to integrate it in the broader transport system. And it also has to cooperate with the existing infrastructure. If you have done all this, so if you have technology that works, is allowed and is integrated, you still need people trusting it and using it. Because if people don't want to use it, you will not get those benefits. So uh, in, 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 in this session today, we will look at, uh, at the bottom part. And I think it's crucial to point out that in order to unlock the potential, you have to address all elements. You cannot leave one out. So from the European Commission, we just entered the new framework progr program. Uh, it's a seven year program called Horizon Europe. And you see that in pillar two, there is uh, climate, energy and mobility. If we zoom in, you see that there is quite a lot of money uh, available for research in that, um, in that area. And if we zoom in further, you see that uh, uh, CCAM is one of those uh, parts. So there is approximately 500 million euro available for the next seven years for uh, a lot of relevant uh, topics, uh, multidisciplinary topics, I may add. Um, these are the 11 topics that are currently either uh, open or published. And um, you can see here that in this variety of topics, understanding user needs and impacts of CCEM are, are one of those. If we zoom in a little bit further with a little bit more detail, of course, we only have, uh, I only have 10 minutes now, so we cannot go into the details, but you can, of course, look at the publications online. We see that there is one call open now on the analysis of socioeconomic and environmental impacts, and uh, that another call will soon open on artificial intelligence. And there also explainability and trustworthiness are uh, important elements. Now, a few words on the CCAM partnership. Um, so we, we have partnered with uh, a lot of relevant stakeholders in the, in, uh, in the, in the CCAM domain uh, with the main objective to support the development and the market uptake in the end. And uh, we believe that this partnership will help us to better align research and innovation efforts, um, but also to help develop and implement a long-term uh, agenda for uh, coordinated investments and research and innovation. And you can see here that uh, different uh, sectors are uh, involved. 
you also see the URL of the of the the CCAM Partnership Association. Uh, so you can go there for more information, and you can, of course, if you haven't done so as an organization, still join the partnership. The partnership is uh, organized as follows. Um, there are seven clusters indicated that we all think are quite relevant to uh, bring CCAM to the roads, to make it a reality. And at the center of it, you see large scale demonstrations. And this is because we believe that it's very important uh, to do so, because in the end, uh, everything that you uh, think of in theory, you have to put it to practice. And then you will find out that uh, not everything goes as, as planned. Uh, there are an, an, uncertain elements, um, uh, situations occurring, and then you have to uh, in improve. So that's why we really think that large scale demonstrations uh, are important and that all the other clusters are quite supportive uh, of that. And you see uh, partly it's, uh, it's uh, technology, but it's also all the other uh, domains, including the societal aspects and user needs. So finally, I get to the end of my presentation. So I, I, I told you the importance of real life demonstrators. Uh, I think if we want to gain trust, it's better to show someone what is possible rather than tell someone what's possible. Uh, there are opportunities. Uh, so in a few weeks, there is the uh, ITS World Conference in Hamburg. And um, if I'm not mistaken on the Thursday of the conference is actually a public day so the public is also welcome to come to the conference and actually uh, experience some of the demos that are available and I think this is a great way to uh, get to know what is uh, possible so thank you for this Henriette I'll, I'll give the floor back to you Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Tom. Very uh, insightful and concise. <laughs> so nice. And uh, I see you mentioned already the ITS World Congress. I think we will be a lot of people meeting there. I hope in person. That would be very nice. Uh, before we go to the uh, next speaker, I would like to draw the attention on the poll. So the poll is now uh, open. There is one question uh, on it about asking the audience, asking you uh, what in your opinion, are the biggest uh, is the biggest obstacle towards trusting connected and cooperative automated mobility. So is it technological, legislative, or, uh, or is it towards uh, your expectations that you have? So have a look at the poll. It's on the right side from the platform. You will find it close to the Q&A. And answer it. We will come back to it at the end uh, during our discussion. Thanks in advance. OK, let's move on with our next speaker, um, that is Susanna Kra uh, Kak, uh, who is policy officer at the European Commission, Directorate General for Research and Innovation, like uh, Tom. And uh, Susanna will make a wrap up about what has been discussed during the last UCAT conference and give us some highlights also on trust. Susanna, the stage is yours. Yes, hi. Uh, can I share uh, slides to share as well? I don't know if you can see them. Yes, all good. Yes. Excellent. So yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And, and thank you for Stéphane for organizing this session and Henriette for, for moderating. Um, so today I will talk to you a little bit about the UCAT conference that we organized back in April of this year together with the CGAM partnership and offer you some conclusions um, from this event, which I think are very much in line with the topic of the session that we're having today. And not only that, but also I will talk to you a bit about the need for responsible research and innovation to tackle precisely the issues that we're discussing today um, and which revolve around co-creation and inclusion um, and also trust in new mobility systems and services like CCAM. So every two years, uh, we at the European Commission, we organize the European Conference on Connected and Automated Driving. So this is a conference that aims to bring together um, major road transport stakeholders from the private and public sector. So this is political leaders, um, industry reps, academia, road authorities, researchers, et cetera, to discuss the way forward towards implementing and deploying CCAM solutions um, in Europe, but also beyond. And so for obvious reasons this year, the conference was held completely online. And the aim really of this third edition uh, was to kick off the new European partnership on CCAM, so which Tom just talked about, but also very much to take stock of current and future RNI activities on CCAM at EU level. So the idea being, of course, 
um, to see how RNI can really lead to European political and also technological leadership in the develop development story of automated mobility solutions. So all recordings are available online. I invite you to have a look. And in the next slides, I will show you some key takeaways from the conference that are relevant to our discussion today. So, um, yeah, so during the event, we had uh, both uh, policy sessions and more technical sessions. And here you can see some of the main RNI challenges that were discussed during the more technical sessions. So, again, some familiar topics, you know, implementing large scale testing, safety validation, physical and digital infrastructure to support CCAM, um, engaging with users and communities, promoting responsible research and innovation developing AI technologies and so on. So based on all of these sessions and also on the many discussions that took place, um, I will also share with you a couple of key takeaways uh, from the event that are really necessary, let's say, to make CCAM um, future-proof. So first of all, um, and certainly the co-creation of CCAM technologies and solutions um, by involving users in the design process will be essential really to foster acceptance, to foster trust and to meet societal goals. Um, second, uh, you know, decision makers and cities and planners should all develop, you know, strategies that explain the functions and benefits and, and risks of CCAM in, again, transparent way to a wide audience. Um, third, we have comprehensive um, impact assessments on CCAM, on mobility, on society, on the environment. These are all necessary and also need to be coupled with um, support tools to plan and implement these CCAM solutions on the ground with local actors. Then we have stronger cooperation between all CCAM stakeholders. And this is also very you know, important to advance the technology to advance CCAM and to ensure this shift from incrementalism to transformation. And this involves obviously member states and industry, but also SMEs and citizens. Um, then a uh, coordinated approach uh, for sure to identify business models, um, agree on key investments and define coherent deployment plans at local and regional, national, but also international level. These will also be crucial for a long-term deployment of CCAM. Um, and in parallel, you know, we also need to work on a seamless transition between all of these research outcomes at EU or at national level um, with large-scale demonstrations precisely to ensure these uh, large uh, rollouts and ensure that the research is, is sort of effectively enforced. Um, and then finally, and also importantly, international collaboration will continue to play an essential role. Um, you know, to exchange valuable knowledge, create synergies between regions, and also really align global standards to make CCAM a reality, not just in Europe, but also beyond. So these are some key conclusions um, to make CCAM future-proof, but uh, I'll just go to the next slide to highlight a couple of, of, of conclusions that I think are very sort of particularly relevant for today. Um, so when we talk about trust in new technologies like CCAM, I mean, what is certain is that we need to look beyond safety. We need to look, you know, beyond validation, beyond an alignment of investments, you know. Um, we really have to, what we need to do is that we have to get people on board and we have to convince them that if this is happening, you know, these new mobility services are useful, they're trustworthy, they're sustainable, they're reliable. And, um, and to do that, you know, we cannot just base on, the knowledge that we have just as developers or as policymakers sort of, you know, thinking in silos or sort of ready to, de to deploy or ready to regulate. We really need to know what the people want and, you know, what this new mobility transition can actually offer. And this is why you see here, you know, the co-creation, the impact assessments, the social economic aspects, um, the understanding of the risks and benefits uh, at local level, and also very importantly, the feedback loop between this research and large scale demonstrations will actually lead to knowledge and it will lead to exposure. Tom just talked about that just before. And hence also to public acceptance and to trust. And so this is not something that we can take for granted and it actually starts with the research process, which is why I, I wanted to finish my presentation by talking a little bit about the need for responsible research and innovation or RRI. So, um, you know, getting to public acceptance and, and building trust is more complex than just, you know, educating people into accepting a new technology once it hits the market or just accepting technology or trusting technology in general, you know, what does it even mean? So public acceptance um, and trust, should, it should be seen as a dynamic process, which requires co-creation, which re requires also um, interdisciplinary research and public engagement, and it requires us as decision makers or researchers or industry stakeholders to really understand public perceptions, specifically public needs and expectations, which by the way, change over time. So to support this, um, you know, to support and to facilitate this,
this dynamic process, we should focus on having a responsible research and innovation approach. And so what is that? So RRI, it's, it's basically, it's a, a multidimensional concept and framework that offers tools to anticipate and assess potential implications um, and societal expectations with regards to RNI and new technologies, also aiming to foster the design of inclusive and sustainable research and innovation. And in that sense, really, sort of support a research making that is citizen centered, but also fit for purpose. And for CCAM, what this means and what this requires actually is a different way of framing, you know, the problem or framing the issues. Deployment is not an end, you know, technology is not an end, but understanding the broader, con you know, the broader context in terms of how CCAM can answer to individual and collective needs and challenges, that's the right framing. And so to get there, like I mentioned, we need more interdisciplinary research, we need to hear from people that we do not normally hear from, we need opposing views, um, we need social innovation and co-creation, and also very importantly, you know, to empower and collaborate with different, different communities at different levels. And so in parallel to that, um, we also, you know, all actors that are involved in the design and development of CCAM, they have to be clear on what their product or service can actually do. So you need proper communication and awareness raising tools to allow people to have realistic expectations, but also to offer a you know a shared and coherent vision of what CCAM is and what you know and what it and what it proposes. And so this is not just a one-off, you know, this is not just something to, to check off a list, but it's something that needs to be nurtured and you know undertaken in a continuous and inclusive process. And finally, you know, as you can see the last point on, on the slide, and I think Henriette, you'll be able to talk better about this, but the link between all of this research and these demonstration projects will be key because again, it's all about exposure. So if you wanna build trust, you need a multidimensional and tailored approach. And again, um, public perception is not the same as public acceptance. It's not the same as human machine interactions, HMI. It's not the same as public engagement mechanisms. And all of these things are different and require different approaches. And so we have to be clear also about that when we're having, you know, when we're having these discussions. So, you know, I'm happy to say that in, you know, our upcoming uh, research, Horizon Europe, so our upcoming or, or not upcoming, but in our new framework program, um, you know, a lot of these RI components are integrated into, into the legal base. So it means that from the integration of you know more social science and humanities focus on, on open science and social innovation these are all included and integrated into the program and so project proposals will have to comply with these conditions and this will really help to align the research with societal needs and expectations and bridge this gap that we you know that still exists between research industry and the public and so i will just finish uh, with this uh, final slide um so this was a word cloud that we had during the conference that aimed to explore a little bit, you know, what the biggest challenge was to deploy CCAM, CCAM by 2030. So again, safety, as you can see, is a is a is a very is a classical one, but you also see, you know, regulation, acceptance, purpose, social value, reliability. These are all, you know, playing an important role, and this is the, the sort of at the core of what we're discussing today. Um, so that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Susanna. Uh, very interesting to see this, uh, this interdisciplinary, the need for interdisciplinary and multidimensional approach. We can come back on this uh, later during the discussion. Um, so moving to the next speaker, actually, there should be a new poll coming. Um, so there was one already ongoing. Uh, I hope you, you answered to it already. There should be a new poll coming. Uh, so check, uh, check the, the, the poll on the right side of the platform. And uh, while it's uh, being setting, I will introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is Ingrid Skogsmo, who is senior research leader for future mobility at VTI and cluster leader for societal aspects and user needs in the CCAM partnership, uh, which has been mentioned before uh, by Tom. Today, Ingrid will tell us about uh, some, uh, some lessons learned from shuttle projects and also why the second partnership is uh, important in this context of uh, building trust. Ingrid, the stage is yours. Please share your slides. Yes, I will. I hope I'm sharing now. Yes. Yes. Make it full screen Good. and that would be perfect. Yeah, perfect. Good. So, uh, well, the theme here is trust, and I will address that from um, one perspective, because one way of uh, building trust is by delivering what you say you want to do. And uh, as has po been pointed out already earlier today, um, 
mobility for all is one of the CCAM uh, objectives to provide mobility for all. And you saw that Tom, he did actually point this out earlier uh, today. I reused an old slide, but that was still the message then that uh, CCAM uh, has the potential to make transport inclusive mobility access for all. So this for all, what is that? Uh, well, uh, we we think this is important because uh, to build trust is to build trust for all. And uh, in order to think about something concrete regarding CCAM, we said, let's put a use case. And uh, we did that. Uh, I work for VTI, which has a headquarter in the center of Sweden in Linköping, where we run this type of shuttle service. Um, it is um, uh, two... Uh, autonomous shuttles. It has been in operation since um, February last year. Uh, and uh, that is a good way of thinking about the CCAM uh, solution or offer. So uh, when we said, how do we approach this with all? Well, let's see. Yeah. Um, we said, let's do a, a benchmark about shuttles. Uh, there are about uh, more than 80 shuttle projects that have been uh, going on or are going on in Europe primarily, but also in other places of the world that we have benchmarked. And we also uh, used a workshop around this uh, shuttle that I just showed you in Lean Shipping. So we said, um, let's find out uh, about the if we say a mobility concept for all, who is all and what do they need to access? And this type of high level policy goal that you want to uh, provide a mobility service for all, is that matched by uh, what this uh, a demonstrator like a shuttle initiative is actually providing? Is that even addressed? So first question, who is uh, all? Uh, a literature study helped us uh, see that it is actually all people, all persons, irrespective of the factors that you see on the left here. Normally, when we speak about all in uh, transportation, we sometimes uh, um, talk about elderly people. Sometimes we say, well, we have to include the gender aspect. Or if we are really stretching our minds, we may think about people with who are blind or have uh, special needs or disabilities. But there are it is much more to it. And we have to think about all of these groups and all should be able to reach the things that are on the right side here of the slide. So that is sort of the concept of all. And then if we look at the other part, this benchmarking study of the over 80 shuttle initiatives, if you try to see why do you provide a shuttle demonstration? If you are a city, for example, why do you want to have this? Or if you're a community or if you are an operator, uh, we tried to find the driving forces behind uh, providing or running a demonstrator or a service with the shuttle. It was very hard to find, not so outspoken all the time, but the driving forces, which can be said to have some kind of high level policy coupling, is typically to have a reduced carbon footprint, uh, to make better road safety, um, or to, uh, to decrease their own personal car use. Uh, there are, however, several uh, points here marked with the red arrows here that actually have some kind of for all coupling. So there are several driving forces that actually do uh, address for all, such as overcome inequality or prevent uh, social exclusion and isolation due to transport poverty. So that's uh, good to know that there is some uh, uh, backup in the high level policy plans. And then if you look at the individual shuttle uh, initiatives, uh, what do they have an objective? And in that case, is that purpose or objective uh, related to cover for all aspects? Uh, yes, you can say some uh, of the purposes or the objectives with shuttle initiatives are coupled. Uh, many are related to public transportation that you want to promote uh, uh, the access and the use of public transportation, especially by providing a first mile, last mile service. But then you have a whole host of more exploratory um, objectives. They want to learn and get experience with this technology. 
uh, you want to understand how the vehicle works, if it works, uh, or even figure out if there is any use of such a uh, shuttle, if that can be what what it can be used for. So there are some uh, purposes that couple to for all, and you see later on in the table here or further down there are some there are some uh, that also want to for example reduce the car dependency or uh, ensure equitable and accessible options are the target groups however then matching uh, those objectives and the purposes of the driving forces well the again community residence is the typical um, target group along a certain route that you are aware, where you are operating it is normally in quite technology uh, friendly areas science parks or close to them or in uh, well off uh, neighborhoods and uh, the the ones you want to address are those close to to where the line is going um, Visitors, tourists, passengers in general, and also those uh, commuters and those in, in peri urban urban uh, areas uh, are also primary uh, target groups because you want to get them to use something else than the personal cars. So these are typically people who have an alternative or a choice or money or everything of this. Uh, persons with disabilities are target of some um, uh, initiatives, um, and you can see that uh, also some uh, citizens in low medium demand areas, elderly, visually impaired, um, less fortunate disadvantaged traveler groups are much further down the list and no initiative spoke about young travelers. So if you want to build uh, initiative or a service or a CCAM solution uh, that considers all, uh, and you know that all are those on the left, um, there are a couple of building blocks we define because there is very much attention in initiatives and projects today on the vehicles and the sensors and the technology. Uh, that is one type of building block, the sort of hardware, the stops, how you get access. Um, you have to think that all need to be able to take advantage of the vehicles and the access points, for example, and also that the onboard personnel is prepared to handle uh, all. But equally important is that all know about the service, that they can access it uh, through information, um, that there are apps, uh, but also payment methods that work for all. And here you have to bear in mind those that do not know so much the digital um uh, things so information apps and payment methods are important as well it's another type of thing than a vehicle and uh, you have to select uh, where you operate a service um, the timing of the day when a service operates it may be that some of these all groups actually work very odd hours typically not eight to five but maybe in the middle of the night then it doesn't help them that public transportation is very intense in rush hour time. The schedule is important. Uh, the route that it goes to where people do live and work and uh, do other things. So that is another type of building block. And all of these three need to be paid attention to. And you can see the coverage varies. There is a very heavy propensity today to address vehicles. And this is all important to build trust as well, because trust has to be earned by all. And it goes beyond vehicles, HMI, sensors, and drivers. So some recommendations is to include all when we have target, make target groups for demonstrators and initiatives and uh, solutions. And I would especially like to urge that the younger persons have to be included. They are missing completely from the picture that, that we saw today, and they are the travelers of tomorrow. And then, of course, those that opt out of the digital sphere uh, or those they, that cannot master it or don't have enough experience or even access, they cannot be excluded. We have to figure out how to solve that and to go uh, to look at the whole system, not just uh, focus on vehicles. So that was the end. I hope that will contribute to build trust. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. 
Thanks a lot, Ingrid, for this insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions on it, and I have some questions already for you later, but I will keep them for our discussion, for our panel discussion. I suggest we uh, go to the next speaker first, um, who, so that is um, Stefan. Uh, Stefan Drea, who is a senior manager uh, at the innovation and uh, for innovation and deployment, connectivity, automation, and blockchain. He's also the coordinator of the EU-funded arcade project. So Stefan, please share your screen. And once you do it, the floor is yours. Thank you, Henriette. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Great. Perfect. Thanks, thank you very much, uh, Henriette, for the introduction. So it's, it's a pleasure for me to participate in, in this session on a topic that is uh, key for the future deployment of automated mobility, and really also at the core of the arcade project uh, we are uh, coordinating at Ertico. So my objective today is to present some results of the work we have carried out in the arcade project on the analysis of European funded projects and on the identification of lessons learned and future research needs, with a particular focus here on the societal aspects, including acceptance and trustworthiness, and as well large-scale uh, demonstrations. Now first, let me start with a few words about the Arcade project. So Arcade is a coordination and support action funded by the European Commission, and focusing on supporting the coordination of research and innovation and piloting in CCAM in Europe. So the project consists of, of three main pillars. So the one here on the top is the uh, network. So we are federating a large network of experts, organizing workshops or events like the UCAT conference that was mentioned by Susanna, which we organized with the European Commission in April uh, this year. Uh, we are structuring our work according uh, to the seven clusters of the strategic research and innovation agenda of the CCAM partnership. Uh, which has been recently launched in the frame of the Horizon uh, Europe Framework Program. And finally, uh, here on the bottom right, all the knowledge we generate is fed into an online knowledge base, which is meant to be the one-stop shop for research and innovation activities in CCAM in Europe. So the knowledge base is online at the address I indicated here at the bottom. It contains an overview of European funded and national research and innovation projects, regulations and policies, strategies and roadmaps, standards, evaluation methodologies, and the data sharing framework. Um, as well, what is very important when you want to uh, find out what is happening somewhere else and in order to create synergies and uh, share lessons uh, learned is to uh, see actually what is happening uh, in Europe and uh, what better than having a map. So we uh, have been working on a map which will be released on the knowledge base very soon. Uh, we have mapped 150 sites so far for ongoing or very recently finished project classified by types, public road tests, corridors, test tracks, and simulators. And we will also be able to distinguish between the vehicle types that are used in the pilots. So this can be shuttles, passenger vehicles, and trucks. As I said, the map will be uh, available in a few weeks, uh, hopefully. Uh, one of the key activities in the arcade project is uh, the consultation of European funded projects, as I mentioned, uh, and we are collecting lessons learned from projects on technical, financial, uh, legal and regulations and operational aspects uh, through dedicated workshops or surveys. We are also currently carrying out an analysis of 62 Horizon 2020 funded projects focusing on CCAM with the objective to identify the synergies and gaps and to support planning the next steps for both research and innovation and demonstration. So here as well, this analysis is still in progress and we plan to have a report finalized about it uh, very in very early October uh, on the knowledge base. Um, I just would like to present now in this uh, a few highlights of this, of this analysis. I mean, I tried to summarize here the main outcomes of the analysis in, in really one slide. Uh, basically, and what we are focusing on today is more what is in these, this red square here, but basically the results are all converging. We have both for technology and user involvement. We had a lot of projects, but fo uh, focusing a lot on individual technical solutions or involving individual users uh, or stakeholder categories. And the next steps is re really important here to combine technologies. Uh, also assess the combined uh, the impacts of all these combined measures involve more the end user as was already mentioned 
uh, by my fellow presenters, then, and also in particular use realistic settings. Uh, and in particular, having more interaction in complex settings. And for the pilots and the methodologies, what is important is more and more that we work with real conditions and also use harmonized scenarios and harmonized methodologies to be able to compare the outcomes of the different pilots. And that goes on as well for uh, trust uh, and, and uh, uh, citizen engagement methodologies. I think it's very important here to, for example, share questionnaires or have similar approaches. Now I would like to go a bit more in details for some of the topics that we that are the focus of this session. Uh, I mean, as you can guess, it's it's not easy to summarize a, a, a big report in the making. So I will be very quick, but I guess you will have the shares the the slides afterwards. And uh, we, yeah, there are still room in the panel discussion to ask us some questions in case you would like more details. Um, so regarding um, the uh, societal aspects, using it and ethics. A few projects have worked on that actually. So I mentioned them here on the right. So there's the Suave project, for example, the Pascal project, uh, Drive to, uh, to Autonomy, uh, which have already found out some, some key aspects related to acceptability. What they found is that perceived safety, perceived convenience, and perceived environmental sustainability have really a very strong positive effects on acceptability of, of connected automated vehicles. There is, however, a general ambivalence regarding uh, the feelings about cabs. Uh, so many people would uh, more positively uh, see uh, road safety and environmental that the effect, however, they are quite neutral regarding efficiency and very negative regarding privacy. So as was already mentioned, safety is the most important issue for many for cab acceptance. Privacy is, however, a very important concern. And some methodologies or solutions have to be developed really to to create this distrust here, uh, in particular, the fear that people have about surveillance and control as uh, automated vehicles might be uh, controlled remotely. There are also, of course, as was already mentioned, country level differences in the expectations regarding safety and privacy. Uh, and people with great interest in technology seem to be, of course, more accepting of, of cabs. What was found out, I think, by the Pascal project is that uh, people who are more often driving or cycling have a, a lower perceived safety of, of cabs, as I think this is mainly due that on the fact that they re rely on, on clues given by the drivers or the cyclists. Uh, then regarding more legal aspects and ethics aspects, there is still a general tendency in the people that have been uh, interviewed in these different projects to, to keep the manufacturer both legally and morally responsible. And uh, the question about ethics are always very difficult, as of course most of the people in uh, should prefer protect both the, the passengers and the road users. We have been able to derive a few recommendations uh, as well for the next steps for research and innovation. I think many have been already mentioned by, by Ingrid uh, and as well as Susanna, what we found out in the UCAT conference. I mean, the number of participants needs to be increased in future research in order to really find out what are the differences between countries, between uh, genders as well, uh, and subpopulations. It's important to give the voice to these subpopulations, uh, including more vulnerable people. Um, studies, including uh, these categories are really rare and tend to be more qualitative in nature so far. There's also an importance to include affective evaluation. So emotions are extremely important here. Uh, and then future st studies need as well to assess the cultural and language based indicators. Then what would be interesting is as well to look uh, at which autonomous transport solutions uh, actually will, will strike the best trade-offs for citizens. So can it be, is it more privately owned cars uh, or shuttles or public transport? And finally, ethical implications, as I mentioned, are really key uh, to be studied further. Then there are also other aspects for field operational tests. Um, what we have, uh, learned from many of the projects that are carrying out field operational tests is that further research is definitely required on conditions uh, for the introduction at large scale, the impacts of possible regulation policies and the acceptance. Um, overall, the user acceptance is positive, but the real needs evaluation requires really further investigation. What is really a problem at the moment is also the extrapolation of, of the user experience from the trials to real world conditions. I mean, this was, for example, mentioned by projects like L3 Pilot, where they say that uh, due to the prototype nature or the HMI interaction, 
in the automated driving control systems, there's potentially an unpleasant experience. Uh, also, sometimes there's a requirement to have a, a safety driver on board, and then, of course, people will not react in the same way. So this can have conditions, and he, this is really the difficulty in here, re, le, getting this possibility to have people using these systems in their real life conditions. And finally, this is my last slide, just a few of the other aspects that we have been looking into. So there are, of course, the human machine interaction aspects. This was mentioned. So it's, uh, although these are all individual aspects, I mean, we need to look at all of them to get the complete picture. I mean, what was found out by some projects is that the design of the human machine interface has a very strong influence on user acceptance. It needs to be very well integrated because automated vehicles should eliminate all the usage concerns. I already mentioned that it's important to involve the end user, uh, explore further the driver state technology and adapted design strategies, and then expand research in interaction with more uh, automated vehicles and more road users in more complex settings, really involving more actors. For soci socioeconomic and environmental impact analysis, we at the moment have a lack of proper impact assessment methodologies to compare advanced CCAM services. So I mean here really combined uh, services, combined sensors, combined perception methodology. And finally, I already mentioned as well, so the ethical implications of automated decision-making needs to be further assessed. So with that, um, I mean, we reached the end of my presentation. I'm really happy to take any questions at the end of, uh, of the session and uh, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, uh, Stefan, for, for the presentation. I really invite everyone who is working in the field of automated driving to, uh, to check the uh, knowledge base, the, the, the links that you just show on your screen, Stefan, because there are so many information on it. It's uh, extremely useful if you start a new project or if you want to, to collaborate more on these topics. Okay, so I will uh, be the last speaker just for the audience to remind, don't hesitate to use uh, uh, the chat, the chat the Q and A for asking questions. And uh, there are still some polls open, so uh, check them out and we can discuss this afterwards uh, during our uh, panel discussion. Okay, sharing my screen now, I hope it works well. Um, so yes, uh, what I want to, so as a, just a, a last a final insight for our uh, session today on, on trust. I want to show you what we are doing in the show project. Uh, the show project is a very large scale uh, demonstration project. Uh, and we have a user engagement, of course, in it, uh, fortunately. And I will tell you a word about it as I am the uh, project coordinator for this one. So very, very briefly about the, the project is about deploying shared, connected, and electrified uh, vehicles with CCAM uh, within cities. So we focus on cities and peri-urban areas. It's now the largest one, uh, largest project ongoing uh, in the number, regarding the number of partners. So 69 partners, it's a lot. And we are uh, about, like within 13 European countries. Uh, we are uh, around middle of our project, let's say, and we target a uh, real life demonstration in 20 cities. Mm -hmm. Check out the website, you will have a lot of detail. I will not go deep into the project, mm -hmm. but what I can tell you is uh, for, we will have um, this demonstration happening uh, in Europe, all over Europe, uh, next year, starting next year with, uh, so on real life. Now we are testing, we are doing our, our pre-demo, and we will go next year uh, into, into real life and we will deploy a different type of automated, uh, automated vehicles. So individual one for car sharing or ro a robot taxi, but also the usual shuttles and uh, towards also public transport, more like um, mass transit, having uh, public buses retrofitted. Our demonstration plan is here, as I mentioned, I don't stay long on this slide, but what is important to mention is really our real life demonstration starting next year and as you can see it's over like most and that will that is key for uh, reaching really the users a real citizen let's say because they will have time to test the services and to give the feedback and to experiences and so on so the goal is really that it's integrated within uh, their life regarding our uh, the user engagement strategy in the project it started with the identification of end users and stakeholders. 
Um, so our services ensure what we develop are uh, meant to be tested at campus uh, to, for our students, also children, like special area where there are schools or hospitals, for example, business areas, but also, uh, for example, um, elderly or uh, elderly. So it's, it's covering all the user groups that uh, Ingrid has mentioned before, but also it looks at cities and or a bit very urban uh, area. So we will have a, a variety of engagement strategy, uh, uh, yeah, engagement strategy in the project. We're starting now with uh, online surveys and interviews uh, that you can find on the, on the links that you see online. If you go to the show project uh, website, you can find very easily our citizen engagement um, strategy, and you can find our pre-acceptance survey that is already open. We also have a series of workshops so it can be uh, ideathon, hackathon, focus groups that I will uh, tell you more in a bit. And we, have, we will have also local demonstration events on all the cities that we mentioned before. Regarding our, uh, the way we progress with these workshops, we have ideathon, hackathon, and focus group, and each of them have different purposes. So the ideathon is really about gathering ideas. In hackathon, we select ideas from the ideathon and we develop them further. And in the focus group, we evaluate uh, what has been uh, what has been uh, developed uh, before? We are doing a first one now with um, on general user uh, assessing the user needs on AV on a high level, and without direct involvement from end users, but more like user representative. And in the second round, uh, we will go to really like the demonstration. So starting next year, we will go uh, on the demo sites or the cities that you have seen and in involve directly end users. What is important to mention is, okay, one idea done took place already, but there will be more to come next year. Uh, it took place with 39 end users and users representatives. But now, now it's really uh, getting serious, I would say, because we have our hackathon happening and we will have for this um, a pre-hackathon at the uh, ITS World Congress in Hamburg next month. And also what we call the real hackathon that will be over several days with things will be really Develop in detail in November. Um, it's uh, probably in Brussels that will be confirmed. So check out our website and we'll have all the details or get, uh, get in touch with me. And here is really having a diversity of expertise, but also really developers that will uh, develop the, all the ideas that have been defined before into something more concrete that we can integrate into the project. And later in the beginning of next year, we will have focus group for evaluating um, our concepts. So um, some common events uh, that, that you can see here is, uh, um, so the pre hackathons that I mentioned already um, that will come next year, but we have also next week actually already the second pan-European workshops in which we will discuss a similar topic, but really like what are the building blocks necessary for, for reaching a sustainable CCAM and within sustainable, we mean of course also as uh, a CCAM deployment that respects uh, the, the user needs and wants mm -hmm. and expectations and so on. Mm -hmm. So check everything out and you will have also the, all the detail on the website. Don't hesitate to subscribe also to our newsletter and follow us on social media. And um, now I think uh, I am at the end of my presentation and I would be very happy to answer any question to the project. Don't hesitate, hesitate to write in the, in the uh, Q&A. And what I suggest to do now is I will, uh, we are ready actually to move on to our um, panel discussion. So I hope all the speakers are ready. <laughs> I can see you all uh, at least, so perfect. And let me see, uh, let me start first. There was one question that I could see. Um, sorry, I, I saw one question earlier in the chat, I'm trying, yes, there was a question about a topic that we haven't emphasized explicitly, I think it's more in the background of everything that we are doing. Um, a participant asked, how will the personal data of every single citizen being protected when CCAM will be implemented? And I think that's something that, yeah, we have always in the background, the data protection uh, topic. When, when we are working in every European project, we have to take care of that. We have always like an ethic manager, uh, ethic manager dealing with that. But uh, how can we 
how can we ensure it? What I understand from this question is even like beyond uh, beyond the project. Um, I would like to go through the through the speakers in the in the order, if it's okay for for all of you, um, to have a word about uh, especially data protection and what links can you see also with with trust. So Tom, if you agree, I would I would like to start with you. Would you like to to comment on this uh, on this question? Yeah, well, first of all, of, of course, we have to be uh, GDPR compliant with all the services that will be uh, rolled out. Um, I, I think for a, a lot of the uh, services that, uh, that we have in mind and that uh, developers have in mind, there is actually no personal data uh, necessary. It is quite often you, you need a certain state uh, of, of, of the traffic flow, of the surroundings, of other traffic participants. So it's not necessary to know who is where, but uh, you, you do need uh, the state and, and, and the position. And of course, there's always uh, an argument that uh, if you dive deep enough into the details of the data, you could probably unmask uh, who, who that person uh, would be. But I guess that's all also a, a fundamental a balance between um, uh, the, the more personal the data is, the more service, tailor-made service uh, you, you could get. So there's, of course, always a possibility with um, uh, opting in uh, for certain services. Um, so that is uh, certainly also one, uh, one approach. And um, I, I believe, uh, Susanna, if I'm not mistaken, in the, in the uh, re report with uh, uh, recommendations on the, the ethics of uh, connected and automated vehicles, there's quite a large, a large section also um, uh, on this. And uh, some of those recommendations are yeah, ad advised to be taken into account uh, in, into upcoming projects as well. Right, yeah, so maybe I can jump in. Um, absolutely, and I think, well, first of all, to go back to what you're saying, Tom, I mean, these services and these products, I mean, they will have to be GDPR compliant. There is a legal framework in place right now to take these you know, concerns into account. Interesting also, because it makes a link with what Stefan has just mentioned, that privacy remains a main concern, you know, and a sort of a main obstacle, you know, towards public acceptance, towards trust. Um, so yes, indeed. So we have worked with an expert group um, uh, a while ago to develop recommendations um, on on having, you know, on ethics of connected and automated vehicles. And it's true that um, data protection was a big part of it. It was more also related to data and algorithms and artificial intelligence in general. So you know, on top of you know legal frameworks that are existing, you would also need research to see if there are any novel data conflicts that occur, you know, when developing and deploying these new services and these new systems. Systems. Um, so again, you can go back to the research in, to look into what these uh, conflicts could be and what that would look like in practice, because certainly, you know, um, this type of automated mobility solutions are still not massively on our road. So we have to, you know, we cannot sort of base ourselves of what is already out there. We have to look into that. We have to research that. So I think that's a major concern and, and one that we cannot answer to sort of right now, but that we have to very much take into account in, in the upcoming research that we're doing. And, and also ultimately, you know, um, uh, in, in, in the legal frameworks that we already have um, in case there are major concerns that we're not looking at. Thanks. Um, from um, Ingrid, from your perspective, with all the, the projects you have been involved to, did it come, the, was it like a mention often, so you had all this ranking about concerns and so on, so was it mentioned often, this data protection? And how it may affect uh, I have to say, we, we did not uh, poll uh, people in the individual uh, um, ongoing initiatives, but I think what, uh, what it points to this concern, because it is a concern, is that uh, these three building blocks we looked at, you know, the vehicle, then it may be you, you run the tests uh, and you run pilots and you develop the vehicle to, to be GDPR compliant. Then what you do with the information and the apps and everything else you sign up to. I mean, the other building blocks there, there you have to really pay attention. I think when, when it gets more into personal preferences, of course, in the vehicle, if you have a very personalized uh, human machine interface, for example, that could also be a problem. But as Tom said, uh, I think that there should be ways to opt in 
uh, for things and not necessarily have to opt out if you don't want to be a part of it. But yeah, bottom line is that I think it is very important to to address uh, data protection also in these other parts that are parts of services, not just the vehicles. Yep, thanks. Um, Stefan, do you want to add something on this based also on your uh, all these lessons learned that you have from projects? Yes, definitely. I mean, it's 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 a very interesting question and very important topic. And GDPR is actually also something we are looking into uh, in the arcade project. So we had a workshop uh, not uh, some time ago on the methodologies and as well on data sharing framework, where we looked at uh, a GDPR, but more of course from the side of of the testing uh, exceptions, because of course GDPR is also a barrier to for all the testing activities, because sometimes you cannot get access to all the information you would need. Uh, for the evaluation, uh, actually. And so we have been looking into how can we uh, uh, use the best practices and lessons learned from the many uh, projects uh, to improve that um, and find ways of better de-anonymization de-anonym of the users. But what, what I would like to mention is what I've, indeed I've, I mentioned in my presentation that a project like Pascal, for example, really highlighted the fact that privacy is a main concern. But I've been involved as well myself in one citizen dialogue organized in Lille, and, and here I've seen this as well raised by many, many citizens. And uh, what I found interesting is that people seem to say that, okay, at the moment when they have applications on mobile phones, they directly opt in. I mean, they don't ask, ask questions themselves and so on, but, but they were wondering for automated vehicles and for mobility in general in the future, uh, if they decide not to opt in, will then they still be able to use the mobility service and they really feared a lot about exclusion if they don't opt in and, and these are really things that we need to consider you see these are questions that we that don't necessarily come to mind uh, when you work on it but when you talk to the citizens then you have this these important questions raised so and maybe Oops, if, Susanna, I, if, you... if i can just add to that i think what you're saying stefan is very interesting because also this you know concern about data and, and privacy i see it also very much as an umbrella term and what you need to figure out is also for people you know what is meant with my data you know um we give data away every day this is something that is sort of a, a compromise that we're dealing with living in the century that we live in and you know and in the world that we live in so we need to understand also as as users um you know what is precisely meant with my data which data is necessary um which which what type of data is super fluid you know and and what is the data that i want to give or can give um and and what is the trade off that i'm willing to make to use certain services because this is also i think it's something to be nuanced a little bit more what is really meant with the data because you know, it's it's data is needed today if you wanna if you wanna do something if you wanna develop something, so it's sometimes seen more as an umbrella term, a little bit too broad in, in two broad terms, I would say. Yes, and uh, definitely, and what what I would like to add on that, and what I noticed also from the citizen dialogue that Stefan mentioned before, the fear that the that the participant had was who who is dealing with the data and there was a big difference if it is for an authority if it is for an enterprise if it is a third party and so on and i think that's where also transparency could help that we tell the people that who is dealing with their data who is like uh, managing them that could maybe go towards more, more trust because they the, there was different from the results there was different trust into different bodies let's say for different uh, applications and like uh, roles in the CCAM. Um, landscape. Okay, uh, before moving to the uh, thanks a lot for answering this question. I hope it answers the question from the participant. Um, before moving to the to some uh, questions that I would like to ask to uh, to the speakers, um, just for you to know, so for the speakers to know about the poll results towards the question about the biggest obstacles towards CCAM. Um, there is not enough answers to say that we reach something significant, uh, unfortunately, but I just wanted to let you know that on the first place, it was a technological, so thinking that maybe the technology is not ready or safe. The second one was on expectations, like fearing that the mobility needs are maybe not uh, enough considered in the development of CCAM. And the last one was legislative, so that the legal frameworks are maybe not able to reflect all the complexity of, of CCAM. So just for you to know, 
Um, I will ask you questions one by one now, and if you want, you can also reflect on this poll, on the, what, it, what it means to you. So going uh, back to the, to the uh, first presentation that we had from Tom, and what I would like to, to ask you, Tom, um, is, so you presented us uh, the new Horizon Europe uh, program, so where it is clustered, how, so what is the budget that uh, the Commission will spend on it, and so on, what, are its, what is the vision? also matching with the SICAM association that was newly formed. But regarding trust, especially, what is different from the previous program, from the Horizon 2020 program? Is, it, is there a difference? And uh, how is it different? And uh, did the commission somehow change a bit the, the way of looking at things when we talk about uh, trust? Yeah, I, I think some changes are uh, also uh, gradually. Huh? Uh, I think when the previous uh, framework program uh, uh, was written, especially in the beginning, uh, this was also uh, uh, just before the, the top of the hype cycle. So there were, there were a lot of uh, uh, positive uh, uh, expectations. And uh, I, I think you, you already noticed some changes um, in the previous framework program. And I think the project you are running is one of those examples where, um, uh, where the user is, is taken, uh, uh, let's say, into consideration from the beginning. So maybe one shift or, or a change uh, could be is that uh, it, it used to be more on HMI and user acceptance, where acceptance has a little bit of negative connotation because it sounds like something that you can enforce on, on someone. And now it is shifting, I think, a bit more into involving the users, having user-centered design and, and you know, trying to have society actually embrace those uh, solutions. Um, another difference is the budget. I mean, the budget is higher, so that also means there is a, a bit more available uh, uh, for these topics. I think they will also be um, uh, integrated a bit more. So as, I, um, as we mentioned before, we have some recommendations from the expert group on, on ethical aspects. Um, I, I can imagine that some of those recommendations will be taken on board in, in, in future calls, but maybe not necessarily a specific call on those recommendations, but more in a way that it's integrated into, um, in, into new topics. Um, so I, I, I think those are a couple of, uh, of, of changes. And uh, well, maybe good to mention is uh, uh, that, well, many years ago, uh, it was quite often um, an afterthought where engineers uh, thought, oh yes, uh, there are some users and we have to make it accessible or easy for them. And uh, it is now more and more regarded as an integral part of, of the whole uh, solution. So they are taken into consideration from the beginning. Yes, I, I see. And uh, really from this beginning, to co even in, maybe in the conception of projects, that maybe some things we, we could even consider. Uh, having really the, the, the user needs considered from the scratch. And, and, and maybe one, one thing uh, to add. And uh, so what is also new is that we have to seek a partnership. And uh, so th this is also a possibility. Uh, you, you can join the partnership and from the partnership, you can propose uh, uh, topics. So if, if there is a, uh, um, a critical mass within the partnership that thinks that these topics are really, really relevant, um, then it, it, it may uh, uh, trickle down into the uh, the topics. So, yep, I see. so uh, everyone is encouraged to join the, the yes. CCAM partnership and contribute and raise the voice uh, so that the, the user needs are, are really uh, addressed in the in the future projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I will move to uh, Susanna. So from uh, your presentation, I was uh, so you mentioned uh, social innovation. So it was in one of your slides. And for me, it's a bit of a buzzword, if I may say. It's a bit, um, I have some concept in mind, but what is meant with that and so on. But can you, can you tell us more? How, how do you see that? And what is the link with trust? And how do you think that social innovation is? Is it the solution for trust? Or is it one of these? So tell us more. If you could come back on this, that would be great. 
Uh, no problem. So it's certainly one uh, solution. I mean, it, it's one approach. Uh, again, like I mentioned, I mean, if you really want to build trust, you need to have different approaches because it, it needs to be complementary because we're, you know, addressing different aspects, different challenges. But so social innovation, like I mentioned, it's, uh, and I agree, it can be seen a little bit as a buzzword, again, as an umbrella term for a lot of different things. Um, but social innovation, really, it's about empowering and collaborating with different communities at different levels. So these are, you know, citizens, experts, decision makers, policy makers, innovators, and to really co-create solutions together. I know that that's another sort of buzzword, but what it means is that it's not just about hearing different opinions or dropping a survey once in a while. It's really about including, you know, these different communities in the policymaking process. And here, I mean, you know, for us at DGRZ, about the research policymaking process. And so what social innovation is, it's about connecting society with innovation. And it's about, you know, proposing new ideas or products or services or methods or models that originate in a process that precisely empowers these different communities and businesses to, you know, collectively think together um, on the problems or challenges that need to be solved. And this also from an early stage and not leave this reflection to just a handful of actors or to have this done in a, in a unilateral way. And so what it does, it, it, it just, it really puts the focus on bringing together different actors from, you know, the problem identification, the challenge at hand to the innovation, design, development, implementation. And so this includes, you know, civil society, you know, national, regional authorities, municipalities, academia, again, innovators, business sector. I mean, it, it really should be very broad and it should be interdisciplinary. Um, and so for CCAM, what is important is, is this social innovation because it will generate bottom-up solutions to challenges that are currently being faced in the research because we're still very much in a, also in a research phase. Um, and it will make this, these all, you know, all of these different innovations more relevant it increases their buy-in, it boosts their diffusion if you start that you know, from bottom up. And so it will help to ensure public acceptance and trust in these new technologies. And this is also why you know, we have a topic on societal needs and social, economic and environmental aspects now in the framework program, because we need to have these inclusive discussions at, you know, at all of these different levels. So it's not just about the content in terms of what are we researching, um, what are the products that, you know, that we're looking into, the innovations, uh, but also how do we do that? What's the process like? And in that process, you know, it needs to be reflexive, it needs to be anticipatory, and it needs to be inclusive. So that's what's meant with, with social innovation. It's also very much about having a, an, an approach that is less, you know, technologically focused, but focused on having societal desirable outcomes as, you know, uh, a main arch uh, or arc of, of, of the research that is being done. Yeah, great, great. That's, that's much very well also with what Tom said before, that previous project may have focused a lot on HMI and so on, and that we are now, there is a bit of a shift, and uh, I know like I, I'm a lot in discussion with Ingrid about this topic, so it will lead very nicely also to, the, to, to Ingrid uh, topic so that we, yeah, we need to look more at the big picture, which type, I would even say which, which type of cities do we want, which type of societies, how do we what does it mean like sustainable mobility in front of us and how CCAM can help that? And part of it is this integration of users instead of looking at one project uh, in isolation. So yeah, okay, I, I, I got the point. So I, I'm sure the, the audience also, thanks a lot. Um, Ingrid, I will move to, to, your, uh, to you uh, for, for my question. And this is, I would like to come back on the, um, you are, in our talk that we have, because we collaborate a lot, but also in your presentation, you mentioned this all, so mobility for all. And I would like to come back uh, to come back to you on this, because what we can see, for example, considering some, um, SICAM is all often associated with technology. And when you think of new technology and so on, we may have uh, sometimes a, a discrepancy with, uh, with some, person that may not have a digital literacy, I'm thinking of this, may not have a smartphone and so on. So how will how can we make sure that there is like the benefit from the second development? Is it a bit what you're thinking when you are considering this mobility for all or when you are claiming on it? Is it like, uh, like do we have to include really everyone? Is it absolutely necessary? What is your, where do you put a bit as a boundary or like we mm -hmm. can't put any boundaries. So tell us, tell us a bit like your, your yeah. And, and the starting point, I think, is this: um, when you look into, uh, for example, uh, Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020 <laughs> topic text, it always says that it should be all situations and all road users and all, all, all. 
And then uh, the ambition is to serve all. So then you start to think, what do we do? And if you look, uh, I come from the vehicle industry and I see that a lot of effort has been made on, as we spoke, HMI, driver attention, uh, getting the drivers to accept automation and handovers and things. And I think our, our concern was that those aren't all. Uh, if, uh, if you make good things, automated cars that are really expensive and uh, that can be sold to a certain fraction of the society, will you really reach the societal targets then? It will be hard to make an Im uh, impact on uh, climate change if there is just a few, uh, well, a minor portion of the, of the community that can access those car uh, cars. So we have to figure out what, how do you get more on board? And even if you don't reach all, probably it helps a lot to think more about uh, who else uh, than the drivers. And I think the, the way that um, you also explained, um, Susanna and Tom, that you're addressing um, uh, the community today and the Horizon Europe calls, uh, that it, it moves from the vehicles and moves from a sense of, please like our new technology, accept it please, uh, to be more, Okay, so if this is going to be useful enough for somebody to, to really think this is good and worthwhile to, to take CCAM uh, as an alternative for something that it enriches their lives, we may have to think differently. So I don't know if I answered the question, but that is really, I think, the, the important uh, aspect of, of thinking about with all that uh, you may not need to, to take on everyone, but I think the, the biggest failure we would make is if we would assume that everyone is really digitally savvy, everyone goes for uh, the, has uh, the means to, to uh, buy services that cost a lot. Uh, we have to think about everyone, uh, uh, to think about uh, a large part of society and we cannot uh, increase the inequity um, through CCAM. We should see if there are some smart ways we can figure out how CCAM can be an inclusion tool, tool and uh, uh, to work to increase the uh, equity between different uh, groups in society. Yes, yeah, yeah I, I see exactly your point. Oh, sorry, someone, there was a, a background noise, sorry for that. Yeah, thanks, thanks uh, Ingrid, for, for making this uh, clearer. So it's really about a, a new kind of a new mindset coming, I would say, uh, that uh, towards like what, what we want to uh, what we want to achieve and being sure that we don't forget, we don't let anyone behind uh, through uh, our development. Um, now I would like to go to uh, Stefan for a, a question regarding your presentation and exactly aligned with everything that has been said also before. So with all these reviews that you have done about projects, um, have you seen, and I would be even personally, because you know I'm running the show project where we will have our demonstration starting next year. So focusing also on the projects who have pilots, who have demonstration, have you seen some, uh, from the lessons learned, some mistakes that should not be replicated in future projects? Because we speak like there is a lot of best practices, I think it's super important. But is there something that yeah that we should be careful not to do again and do better in the next in the next program when it's about trust and and if possible pilots, but maybe more in general also projects. Yes, indeed, of course. I mean that's exactly the objective of, of collecting the lessons learned. Uh, I mean it's not easy actually to get this kind of information from the projects. I mean our analysis we did it on on public deliverables and generally, yeah, the, the kind of mistakes people do is really not, not highlighted there. So I think as well that it's very important that in the future we have this process of also asking all these projects to report about their, their mistakes and their issues and how, and to share it uh, openly so that we, we can also learn from it. Uh, I think regarding more social acceptance or the, the user awareness or acceptance part from the projects, uh, I think traditionally, uh, the projects are looking really at the uh, more only at the user 
as a, as a consumer actually, and um, they have. I mean, they are generally just presenting the product or using it, and then seeing how the people will accept it and how they will react. And and um, and I think definitely that here there is really, as we mentioned, all this process that where you need to be, we need to involve them from the start to also learn about the requirements and their needs from the start, as was highlighted. And I think uh, as well using or sharing the different questionnaires that 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 were developed would be extremely, extremely useful. I think many of the projects are struggling at the start to say, what are the right questions? How do you involve the people in the right way? And that's why really we have been building as well this, this, this knowledge base and in the arcade project to help uh, uh, sharing all this knowledge um, so I think as well that it's it's really important here to have this this step by step approach. Uh, I mean, you also mentioned the HMIs. I think many of the projects have reported that they had some troubles in in presenting the the information right to the to the um, to the user. And then in the end, there's this question I highlighted as well about the extrapolation. So how do you make really all your testing activities as realistic as possible to get really a realistic uh, um, yeah reaction from the users? Um, and so on, and 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 then for me, what 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 is beyond this this project aspect? I think there's also the importance of the awareness of, of the decision makers. I mean, many of the projects are have a strong interest from the cities, for example. They are very interested in carrying out more tests, but they don't know how to do it with involving the citizens. I mean, we have been within Ertico conducting now a, a city moonshot initiative where we have interviewed more than 150 cities as of today. And a lot of the cities, I think nearly 75% of them really ask to them us about, about methodologies on how to better engage the citizens. Generally, they are more in a reactive approach. So when people have a problem or a complain about using a service, then they, they collect the, the needs, but they don't do it regularly on a regular basis. So, so here it's and it's very important to raise this awareness. And that's why it's also we want to organize different sessions like this today to raise this awareness, share the best practices. And at the upcoming ITS uh, World Congress in Hamburg, which uh, Ethico is organizing, we also have a session there really aimed at, city, at cities to, to learn more and to get these methodologies shared. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, I hope we'll, I can imagine that the ITS World Congress will be a, a good place to, uh, to discuss this uh, further. Uh, still, we have a few minutes left, so I suggest we, we maybe we go slowly to a conclusion from each of you. And the way I would like uh, you to think of this conclusion, if possible, of course, uh, you may raise a, a, new, a new topic or you may add a, another uh, something that you want people to remember before leaving the session, is the question of the gap that exists. It has been mentioned by Susanna, it's something we have discussed also in the past, that there may be a bit of a gap between the policymakers, the, uh, the development and the citizen. And they may not always, like citizen may not always understand uh, why things are developed or what the, what the, the final goal and so on. And um, I, I am sure that if we manage to, to bridge this gap, we will uh, reach more trust. But what's your view on how we could do that very concretely from your point of view and maybe also from your kind of uh, stakeholder point of view. So speaking from the European Commission perspective, speaking from a research institute, speaking from an association point of view, how do you think we can connect more with the users and may, make them maybe also more like the citizen, even like make them more aware about our, our projects, our developments, what we are doing. Uh, yeah, so I would start again from the scratch. Um, Tom, is it okay for you if we start again? Uh, yes. Yes, that's uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I I think we we need to tell the nuanced uh, story and the and the, and the real narrative, and uh, this is not always easy because uh, it takes time. It's uh, it's it's easier to have a couple of uh, uh, of, of, of headlines, um, but it's it's important not to not to tell the marketing story, but uh, the real story. So maybe we we need some sort of initiative or a, a more an educational program where we uh, or or a campaign. Uh, uh, okay, maybe it could be a C campaign in in, in this aspect to to talk more about uh, C cam. Um, and it's not only uh, uh, telling, but also showing and 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 letting letting them experience. And I think if um, 
um, if if these different groups um, have to do something together, it's also easier to um, to appreciate uh, the the other perspective. So um, it's I, I think it's also important not to to view let's say automated vehicles as the solution for all the mobility problems. I think it's also important to look at the whole mobility system as a sustainable and smart mobility system where there may be a role in certain situations for vehicles and then they might as well be connected and automated because we think they have certain benefits. Um, but it's it's not the other way around. It's not that you can solve all problems with um, shuttles and, and cars and, and trucks that are automated. And I think that's yeah. also important to uh, to look at from a more let's say from a from a planning uh, perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for this uh, concluding word, Susanna. From your side, uh, how do you think we can we can bridge the gap? And just for your information, we have four minutes left for a session for uh, Ingrid and Stefan also. So sorry. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll be quick. I mean, again, talking as a policymaker, I think that it starts with the process of policymaking. So that that process has to be inclusive and that that process has to be open and and focus on, you know, on on, on openness and transparency and, and sort of open science between, you know, all of the people that are actually doing, you know, the research. Um, and again, for me, it's a responsible research innovation as an approach that can tailor to that. Um, also, what everybody's been saying, being realistic about what the expectations are and what we can offer, you know, with these things. Um, I think that you would, if you're realistic about that and you have realistic scenarios where you can test things out, then you would also have, you know, more uh, sort of, um, uh, meaningful engagement with the people. Um, and also, finally, having a look at, you know, where is a lack of trust? And this goes back to the question, you know, the first question. Um, there's a technological obstacle, okay, but there's also, you know, an expectations obstacle and a maybe a legislative obstacle. Who, you know, where do you put your trust? In whose hands do you put that trust? And and where, you know, is the lack thereof? Is it a lack in the trust in science, in technology, in policy making, in governance? I mean, these are all questions that also have to be taken into account, and which we can also facilitate as as policymakers. I would say that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, Ingrid, from your point of view, how to how to best bridge the gap between policymakers, industry, and and citizen? I think it's simple. Just make develop good stuff, offer good stuff, things that improve your uh, the you and me the situation for us. And uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but something that is better for people in general, and also that helps the society to reach its targets. And I think this with the trust and ethics, you expect that. If things go wrong, that is when you start to question how should the trust be or, oh, this is unethical, but you expect that. So we just have to fix that and then do good stuff. That's my bottom line. Thanks a lot. Very, very concise and very clear. Uh, Stefan, so Not you so would easy. be the... <laughs> Indeed. Um, Stefan, you will be the, the, the last. Uh, what do you think? How can we bridge uh, the gap? Yeah, I know for, for me, as you mentioned as well, the different perspectives so, uh, from ethical side, probably as a multi-stakeholder partnership. I mean, the idea is to have this, this multi-stakeholder cooperation between all the different actors. And that's also why the CCAM partnership was rebuilt, to have really all the value chain represented. And the, the users, the citizens are part of this, this kind of this stakeholder chain. So they need really to be completely part of the process. And I think as well, what, what uh, Tom mentioned is essential for me. I mean, automation is, is of course, we need awareness campaign, show a bit the benefits, maybe help people reducing a bit the fear that they have and this fear of, of technology in general and innovative solutions. But then on the other hand, really automation is one of the solutions. We have to have the mobility picture as a whole. What I've seen from, from the citizen dialogues as well is that people are wondering, okay, why are you now talking about only automation? I mean, we just want everything to be more efficient, less pollution, less uh, traffic jams and so on. So I really think that for us to bridge this gap, we need to look at the whole picture. And we are already in the right direction at the moment with all the current policy initiatives, but uh, definitely needs the engagement of all the stakeholders. Okay, that's a, a great final word. So, word thinking, looking at the at the entire system, collaborating more, including the users from the scratch. I think that are the things that we can uh, take as a uh, take out from this session. Thank you uh, to all of you. Thank you for the audience for listening, for the questions, for answering the poll questions. 
And uh, we'll see you soon at uh, diverse events that will take place and uh, hopefully in person as well. Thank you all, back to the uh, organizers. Thank you to the panel for that thought-provoking and insightful discussion and for pushing the boundaries for mobility. We also want to express our gratitude to you, our attendees, for being so engaging in this platform. We promise more insightful discussions and more opportunities for creative participation on this Hopin platform in the remaining days of our online events. Even though we have now come to the end of our broadcast for today, you can continue to network and visit our partners on the Expo tab here on Hopin. We will be back for our online session tomorrow at 11 a.m. CET. And after the online session, we will meet in person at Bella Center Copenhagen at 3 p.m. Central European Time. If you would like to join us, get your tickets now at electronomous.com. My name is Jun Young. I'll see you tomorrow right here for day four of the International Mobility Summit. Goodbye for now.